Welcome to the 2022 Legislative Hawaii Energy Policy Forum Legislative Day Briefing. Thank you for joining this virtual dialogue involving all of these uh, legislators, energy policy forum members, and other energy stakeholders. And you know, there's just some plain flat energy wonks who love to come to this annual energy day briefing to deal with the unfinished business of Hawaii's energy transition. We have a jam-packed agenda to engage all of you on Hawaii's most pressing gaps in our energy transition and what further analysis, coordination, and policy interventions can move our energy transition and yet a more advanced stages of renewable penetration and efficiency. This year, our theme focuses on the 1.2 trillion Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, signed by President Biden on November 15, 2021. We'll first set the stage for this year's briefing by touching upon the forum's rebirth this year and the leadership under the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute and the director's take on some of the key gaps to be addressed followed by a very special address that will lay out the opportunities afforded by the IJA. I also wanna point out that if you have questions, please use the Q&A function uh, on this Zoom uh, webinar. And that will be the best way. Please write those questions out clearly and we'll be able to take on any of those if we can, if we have time during the course of this. In some cases, uh, we'll respond later in writing and make sure that we, we get answers to everyone. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. He's the director of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, HNEI, since the year 2000. From his pioneer days in thin film PV design and production, and as a top researcher, then to directing HNEI in its statutory role uh, to analyze and identify cost-effective pathways to Hawaii's 100% RPS goals, Rick has helped HNEI gain national and international prominence in development and demonstration of advanced grid architecture, energy storage systems, renewable energy resources, energy efficiency, and technical and policy assistance to enable energy transitions in Hawaii and abroad. Rick, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mark. That was more than was needed. And at some point, I do have a, a two slides. I'm keeping it to two. Um, so those can be brought up at any point. Although I can't see most of you, I want to thank everyone for your participation today. Uh, as Mark indicated, HNA has been a participant in the forum since its inception, but our leadership of the forum is new. And I want to thank Mark for his leadership of this effort. And I wanna thank all of you who took your time to give your inputs to Mark to help guide this meeting. I also wanna specifically mention Mitch Ewan, Dallas Higay, Megan, who was on the call, as well as Jay and his team for their continued involvement in the forum and all they've done in the last month or so to make this meeting happen. I also wanna specifically thank the legislators who have taken time from their incredibly busy schedule this time of the year to participate especially Senator Wakai and Representative Lowen, who we will hear from later. And finally, I do wanna thank Senator Morawaki for her support to help transition this forum over to HNEI. We do have a very full agenda, so I'm going to try to keep my comments short, but I wanna make them in the context of what I believe is our ability to get to 100% renewable generation. I'm not sure how large this slide is coming out, but, but what it shows is that HNI has used the, the same high fidelity hourly dispatch models that have been validated against the current grid operations to try to glean some insights into how far we can push the development of what I consider the two technologies that are currently expected to be most cost effective. And that's essentially solar and wind. So using multiple years of solar data to account for the impact of the extended periods of low solar resource, we estimated how much energy we think we can reliably expect from solar or the solar wind mix, and then how much firm energy would be needed to support that variable resource. And I wanna be clear, this was an examination of the ability to generate, store, and then dispatch or release that energy when needed. It didn't consider transmission. It didn't consider a number of other constraints that might have an impact on the ability to deliver that energy to the customer. 
as shown in the title line, and it, I will say it's something I, I think Jay never thought he would hear come from my mouth, is that yes, I do believe we have a viable pathway or viable pathways to get to 100% renewable. And this analysis that I'm showing is only for Oahu. And I've used Oahu as an example in the past of you know, the need to do Oahu because it was our large energy user but I'm also kind of comfortable saying, if we can do it on Oahu, we're gonna to be able to do it on the other islands as well. So what we did is with optimistic assumptions about the flexibility of the remaining firm generation on the grid, we assumed the, con the continued use of currently, battery, currently available battery technology. We found that with an additional build out of solar or solar plus wind, we could get approximately 70% or more of the island's energy needs from these variable resources. At around 70%, curtailment increases rather sharply with the four hour storage. It doesn't mean you might not be to do other things to reduce that number or do other more sophisticated management of demand, but this is a pretty simple analysis. So above 70% that curtailment increases and above 90%, the incremental curtailment of new projects increases so sharply, it effectively makes them non-competitive, we believe. The actual upper limit, maybe somewhere between 70 and 90, is going to depend on a number of variables and a number of more sophisticated analysis that are way too numerous to include here. So these percentages do sound reasonable, but to achieve this 70% number, and it's what's shown on the graph, and I'm not sure how readable it is, we would need to install enough solar or enough solar plus wind to deliver another 2000 gigawatt hours per year of energy above what is expected after the currently proposed utility scale projects are installed. This corresponds to some 800 megawatts AC of additional utility scale solar which would require some 6,000 acres of land. And these are all relatively approximate numbers. Distributed solar can reduce this value and it shouldn't be excluded. Every 10,000 homes with rooftop solar and storage would reduce this land need by approximately 250 acres. So the conclusion from that is that there is ample room for, and we really need to maximize both these types of solar. It's not an either or situation. Adding EVs to this mix increases demand and it increases the energy needs that are required. So it means more solar and more wind if you have wind in the mix and possibly more firm power, but it doesn't significantly change the curtailment behavior. And that was one of the interesting things on that graph is where we saw curtailment didn't matter whether it was solar, solar plus wind with EVs or without EVs. So in the example shown, we estimate that electrification of 40% of the light duty vehicles would require an additional 900 gigawatt hours of electricity or about another 2,500 acres of land. And the purpose of that is to just kind of put in perspective the, the magnitude of what we are trying to address. So I wanna close out with a few comments about the need for firm power because that question is being asked a lot lately. With the highest penetrations of variable renewable resources that we estimated here, and assuming the firm power left on the grid is very flexible, we estimate a lower bound of about 650 megawatts or so of firm capacity will still be needed on the grid. While this capacity number seems relatively high, the good news is that with each increment of intermittent variable that goes onto the grid, the need for that generation goes down. So we have to have the capacity on to ensure reliability and to provide power for those short periods of time when we need it. But the use of that goes down. So some of the 600 plus megawatts of firm generation may only be needed a few hours a year. This also means we will need very careful planning and the selection of conventional generation and which ones will be retired. And it will open the door for use of other technologies, possibly including other long-term storage, DR, or hydrogen to help meet these firm power needs. And we haven't gone in and addressed that in a specific way. So I said I was going to keep my comments short. So now that I kind of went on my little tangent there about what our requirements are, I'm going to do that. So even with the limitation of using only technologies that we know are available today, 
we can, from a technical perspective, reach or get very close to 100% of our renewable energy needs. Doing this in a cost-effective, equitable manner and in a way that is acceptable to the community is going to take an amount, immense amount of work. HECO has their IGP process and is expanding their efforts with the community. The State Energy Office has stepped up in a big way to take a more active role in engaging the community in these decisions. Resilience is being considered, but more needs to be done. Energy efficiency must be maximized to reduce the amount of energy and the amount of land that we need. My hope is that this forum under HNEI will foster an open and participatory dialogue on the many challenges that remain in Hawaii's energy transition. We welcome a diversity of viewpoints and opinions from anyone who wishes to participate. And with that, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk and provide these comments. And I hope you find your today is well, time today is well spent. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Thanks for setting the stage so well and uh, really pinpointing the issues that need to be dealt with as we move forward. Uh, so with that, I am deeply honored to introduce our featured speaker, Rose Stevens Booker, uh, to help demystify as much as possible um, at this time, the IIJ and laying out the broad opportunities for Hawaii and the nation. Rose is the regional intergovernmental <clears throat> and external affairs specialist for the West, Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental uh, Affairs at the U.S. Department of, of Energy. It's an extremely important role that aligns, aligns the agenda of the Biden administration and the Secretary of Energy directly with what's going on at the subnational level. And we know that's extremely important uh, for the Biden administration to ensure that the issues that are being developed at the policy level nationally are really carried out at the niche level where all the action takes place. She, she brings to the Department of Energy her knowledge and experience in public-private partnerships at EPA in energy efficiency with her groundbreaking work at Block Power and crafting effective partnership strategies to deliver clean en energy technology solutions to some of the most vulnerable and underserved communities across America. Now, we won't have time to have direct questions for Rose, but again, please write any questions that you have and include them in the uh, in the Q&A portion of the Zoom link. And Rose has told us that she'll do her best to get answers back to us in short order. Now, please welcome Rose Stevens Booker to our Hawaii Energy Policy Forum Legislative Briefing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, and thank you, Mark, and all the organizers for developing this event. I tell you folks, the green, one, the green room was a highlight of humor for my entire week, and I'm going to carry this smile to 5 p.m. Um, all this to say, this event is truly a one-of-a-kind experience, and I, I'm just so honored. Um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to be here and to speak a little about the bipartisan infrastructure deal and the investments Congress has charged the U.S. Department of Energy with delivering by directly partnering with states and local governments to deliver for the American people. Next slide. President Biden's climate strategy puts the U.S. on a path to achieve a carbon-free power sector by 2035 and a decarbonized economy by no later than 2050. This administration is backing its strategy with action. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IJA, is the biggest climate investment in the history of our nation, half a trillion dollars. It will get our country on track to meet the Biden administration goal of reducing carbon emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030. And it is not lost on us that Hawaii is the first state to set Paris aligned goals. And just a year ago, the state legislature passed a groundbreaking resolution declaring a climate emergency that mobilized state action, of which today's meeting is a great example of collaboration in, in Hawaii. Next slide. But very quickly, and to help shape a picture of, of who I am and where I sit, um, I'm a regional specialist. And in this role, I sit in the Intergovernmental and External Affairs Office within the Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs. 
The idea of the regional specialist is somewhat new to the U.S. Department of Energy, and it was an idea directly from Secretary Granholm, who really wanted to provide states, cities, communities, schools, CBOs, and others with a direct connection to the department and vice versa. We are your figurative and literal boots on the ground. Next slide. We're here to collaborate, to convene, and to connect. We're broken into 10 different regions, and I'm honored to be your regional specialist covering Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So please don't hesitate to reach out with questions, concerns, or for a simple hello. You can reach me and the team at DL Regional Specialists at hq.doe.gov. Next slide. So for everyone at DOE, the magnitude of this historic investment, a whopping $62 billion from DOE, represents the largest single change in our agency since the founding in 1977. We are launching 60 new DOE programs, including 16 demonstration and 32 deployment programs, with expanded funding for 12 existing research deployment, demonstration, and deployment programs. And we know that DOE is a big, vast agency, and it can be hard to navigate. So please, again, don't hesitate to use me as your go-to resource to help you steer. As you've heard the Secretary say, we view DOE as America's solutions department. We are shifting from a focus on place-neutral technology to being a place and people-based solutions agency. This means partnering with each of you to understand the specific challenges and opportunities in each of your communities. And it means engaging local stakeholders and active participants in program development and implementation. Because this infrastructure deal is going to help DOE play an even more effective solutions role by sending at least 2.8 billion to Hawaii and its residents to invest in clean energy, electric cars, and public transit, ensuring the state's infrastructure is more resilient to climate change, generating jobs up and down the supply chain, and economic growth. The investments will support uh, Governor EJ's goals for decarbonization, and it is not lost on us when he recently said, net zero is not enough doubling down on challenging transition technologies such as marine and aviation. And we are working to do our part. Next slide. In addition to those investments, the deal will help low-income families who currently pay as much as 30% of their income on energy costs save money and ensure their homes are properly insulated and utilize energy efficiency technologies like the heat pump, which is a misnomer as it's always been an efficient cooling solution. In particular, the bill adds 3.5 billion to DOE's low income weatherization program, which will more than double the impact of the current program. The deal will also help improve the air of our kids and teachers, the air that our kids and teachers breathe, thanks to 500 million in funding for more efficient and renewable powered school buildings. And finally, this law helps DOE increase clean energy and energy efficiency nationwide with, a bil with over a billion in grants to support clean energy programs and projects in communities, states, territories and tribal nations. Uh, they undertake this by way of the 550 million allotted dollars for the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program and 500 million invested through the State Energy Program. And you know, I'll take a moment to stress the importance of, ener of energy of state energy offices, excuse me, and how they direct planning and implementation of clean energy investments and can serve as the conduits for connecting local governments to resources and technical assistance. DOE is committed to supporting state energy offices through programs like EERE's State Energy Program, or SCP. State energy offices use congressionally appointed appropriated SCP formula funding to support state-led initiatives that promote efficiency, resilience, and clean energy in their states. Many state energy offices have also leveraged SCP's competitive awards in recent years to pursue innovative energy projects. Hawaii is a benchmark in this area, 
as an SCP recipient of the competitive funding and use the funds to kickstart the state's work on 3D energy visualization. In collaboration, the SCP, NREL, the Hawaii State Energy Office, and the University of Hawaii at Manoa developed the Hawaii Advanced Visualization Environment Nexus, or HAVEN. HAVEN is being used by multiple stakeholders to explore the trade-offs as the state leads the transformation to more affordable sources of energy. HAVEN visually displays options and fosters, in, and fosters engaged community discussion around complex trade-offs in achieving Hawaii's renewable energy goals. Other states are likely to follow Hawaii's lead and use HAVEN, but the leaders are right here. And we'll kick those slides back up. A secure and resilient power grid is more than just keeping the lights on. It's vital to preserving our nation's security and economic prosperity and the livelihoods of all Americans. Next slide, actually. The infrastructure law transforms DOE in a partner in, into a partner for states, communities, tribes, and utilities through grants to enhance the resilience of the electric infrastructure by establishing a transmission facilitation program for DOE. This program is aimed to help develop nationally specific significant transmission lines and expand the Smart Grid Investment Matching Grant Program, which invests funds for grid flexibility to complement the state's PUC's leadership in performance-based regulation. Next slide. One of the most exciting elements of the bipartisan infrastructure law is the serious investment in major demonstration projects. These are for clean energy technologies that have been proven in the lab and in the pilot phase, but need to be proven at scale. That's why the department will work with industrial partners to essentially split the technology and market risk by sharing the cost of building the first examples of these new technologies. Once they are proven, the market will be able to accurately account for these costs and performance when they replicate the technology. As an example, we've got 8 billion for clean hydrogen. We've been talking about hydrogen economy, but how would that work? Hydrogen and hydrogen blending may be an opportunity for Hawaii as the state transitions its energy system to support a net negative carbon economy by 2045. And finally, demonstrations for the clean energy projects in particular areas, such as rural, frontline, economically hard hit communities. These are places that have heard that the clean energy revolution has an opportunity to change them. And once we demonstrate how that can actually work, it can be replicated in light communities across the country. To reach our net zero goal, we have to replicate these huge projects, dozens and, and hundreds of times across the country. But one has to build that first one to show that it can be done. And that's why these demos are essential. They're an essential element to getting to that net zero by 2050 goal. Next slide. In, in 2008, DOE and Hawaii established a unique partnership for clean energy cooperation that together established a framework for leadership admired worldwide. We look forward to building on this legacy and, ne and never has such a collaboration and a cooperation or Loa Lima, many hands working together, continued unabated. There are so many top opportunities for Loa Lima. And so that next obvious question would be, where can I find that information and when is it coming? This is a once in a generation legislative effort to rebuild the country's infrastructure. Unlike stimulus bills in the past, the bipartisan infrastructure law is a long-term spending solution on competitiveness. The majority of the programs in the bill operate over five to 10 uh, time horizon to provide states, cities, and localities the, sus the sustained support that they need to deliver that transformative projects for their communities. There will be some funding that is formula and will be uh, able to move more quickly. And there'll be other funding that will be, need that will be needed to be competitively awarded um, because we wanna ensure that this money goes out the door to the best with the best chance of achieving the goals that are set out. These programs are going to operate on different timelines. 
And as DOE offices prepare to deliver new programs and existing programs at an unprecedented scale, more direct and ongoing engagement with state and local community partners will need to take place. For local communities, one resource to mention is the White House fact sheet for local communities at whitehouse.gov. Um, outlining key resources for local communities. And we hear uh, there's a version focused on states coming soon. Also, I'd like to invite folks to join DOE's first outreach session to states, which will take place on February 2nd. I know some of you uh, at the state level are planning to attend and uh, we sincerely appreciate it. The state listening sessions aim to get input from state leaders to ensure that we understand your needs for bill funding. Your feedback will be essential. Uh, for our joint success. It will be followed shortly by a local government session on February 9th. So um, please follow up with me with, with questions and concerns and thoughts. Come say hi. And once again, thank you so much for your time today and I'll pass it back over to Mark. Thank you, Rose. Really, we re really appreciate and can't thank you enough. And of course, thank uh, Secretary Granholm for the wonderful work the DOE has been doing, uh, you know, particularly since, you know, we've always talked about DOE being sort of our ace in the hole, uh, you know, with, with uh, support throughout the years. And particularly, you know, I was intrigued with the, you know, over a billion dollars between the state energy program and the energy efficiency uh, conservation block grant program hopefully we'll be able to flow a significant amount of that money here. I know that during the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, we were able to get over $33 million of those two pots of funds to support some of our most important activities of that day. So that really sets up our next speaker extremely well because he's the one that's gonna be uh, dealing with the state uh, energy program funding and most likely the energy efficiency and conservation block grant funding, as well as some other uh, important portions that come from the Department of Transportation. Um, and that's Scott Glenn, uh, the Chief Energy Officer of the Hawaii State Energy Office. And we'll hear what he currently has in mind for the state energy program funding and these other sources uh, and how he plans on taking the responsibility of moving out these uh, to projects. We can expect these efforts to be consistent with the energy office's mission to pro promote energy efficiency, renewable energy, and clean transportation to help achieve a resilient, clean energy decarbonized economy. Scott, we welcome you to the Energy Policy Forum to provide the view from the executive branch on the AJA pro, pro, uh, priorities, procurement and deployment strategies. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Rick and uh, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute for sponsoring us today um, and helping to provide a home for the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. We're very excited about, um, about this new arrangement and working with you all. And also I'd like to thank Rose. I think she had to leave, but I'm very excited and encouraged by what she had to share. And I think it's gonna be very difficult for DOE to spend $1.5 billion among the other 49 states after they send 20 billion to us. So very excited to try to, try to win as much competitive money as we can. Um, also, I thought one of the most encouraging things that she said was that Department of Energy is seeing itself as the solutions department, um, which I think aligns with the perspective that uh, Hawaii has especially in our zero emissions clean economy target, which is aimed for Hawaii to achieve a um, net negative emissions target, which is um, to, to sequester more than we emit as quickly as practicable, no later than 2045. And that phrase as quickly as practicable, I think is pretty interesting from the perspective of a solutions department at DOE. The other phrase she used that I thought really struck true with me was this DOE moving from the perspective of being a place neutral uh, technology department to place and people based. And I think that's a lesson that here in Hawaii, we've come to very much appreciate uh, across the economy as we look at trying to uh, transform ourselves and make sure that the solutions and projects and things that are being built are in tune with the people who live around them 
and are welcome and embraced by people. So I very much embrace the, in turn, the DOE perspective of going place and people-based. Can't emphasize that enough at how important that will be in this energy transformation we're going through. Um, I do have some slides to share, so I'm going to share screen. Um, so first, we'd just like to um, point out the state's current greenhouse gas emissions inventory, um, which the latest data from the Department of Health is for 2017. And just want to emphasize in this slide how much of our emissions are related to energy, fossil fuel use. Um, you can see the dark blue in the bar chart and the pie chart. Um, so about 86% of all emissions in the state are tied to energy use one way or, one way or another. Within that, we have, um, you can break it up into a couple buckets. And so on the left-hand side, you're looking at that total picture of energy. On the left-hand side, you see stationary combustion, which is another way of basically saying electricity um, for most, most purposes. And then on the right-hand side, you see transportation. On the right-hand chart, the pie chart on the right-hand side, you see a breakout of the transportation emissions by their end use. So aviation, ground transportation, um, and then marine ships, boats, um, vessels. So uh, you can see in this chart that um, because of the renewable portfolio standard and the really aggressive legislation and activities that have gone on for the past uh, 10 years or more in Hawaii, we've been able to pull the emissions from stationary combustion from electricity down. Um, but during this time, transportation emissions have continued to grow. And so today we find ourselves where transportation emissions are slightly more than half of our energy emissions, which means they're also a big chunk of our total emissions. Um, and this is also common across the country as other states have been following Hawaii's lead on adopting renewable portfolio standard and aggressively reducing electricity emissions. Um, where our electricity comes from, where our transportation comes from, a big chunk of it is oil. You know, on our renewable portfolio standard, we're at 36% right now um, for renewable energy for electricity, which means about 64% of that is still coming from fossil fuel. Much of that is oil. And if you look on this chart in the top left-hand corner, you can see where our oil comes from. And if you see that big dark gray, dark blue area at the top, that's Russia. Russia provides about 35% of oil in Hawaii. That varies by year, but that's the 2020 percentage. So if you think about our energy security, energy assurance needs, and if you're watching the headlines about what's happening in the Ukraine right now, you can see the connection and why what happens in Ukraine is relevant to Hawaii and our energy security. For the oil that does come to Hawaii, we refine it here and we break it up into multiple uses. About a quarter of it goes to electric power um, and then most of it then goes to transportation needs with about a third of the barrel going to provide jet fuel. Um, we also use it for gasoline, diesel, and other needs as well. We can take that barrel of oil and we can map it onto the total energy system of Hawaii, which is what this is a chart of. And so it looks a little busy. It's a little technical. It's called a Sankey diagram, and it shows our, our whole energy system. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the sources of energy, solar, hydro, wind, geothermal, natural gas, coal, bioenergy, and petroleum. In the middle, you can see all the lines connecting them to how they're used with that orange box at the top for electricity. And then on the right-hand side are the pink boxes that show the sectors that use those resources. And then on the far, far right-hand side, you see Two, two gray boxes. One is energy use. So that's the actual turning the light on or you know, igniting the engine in your car and driving. Um, and that light gray box is wasted energy. That's heat, that's climate change. That's all the things that are pollution tied to our energy use and most specifically our fossil fuel use. So we can map this barrel of oil over this petroleum and see how much it breaks up by electricity, marine transportation, ground transportation, and jet fuel. And so this gives you a sense of really the big picture of our energy system. And as the Hawaii State Energy Office, our job is not to only look at electricity. Our job is to look at all energy to provide a resilient clean energy economy. So when we talk about the different focuses that the state has, when we talk about our renewable portfolio standard, some of the analyses that Rick um, kicked off this presentation with, 
Um, that's these bars up here. That's the fossil energy that goes to make electricity. That's coal and oil that we're looking to replace with solar, hydro, wind, geothermal, biomass, biofuel, um, other renewable sources that might be available. We also have an energy efficiency portfolio standard for the state where we look to try to reduce waste um, and try to be more efficient with the energy we used. And much of that is focused on this side of the chart. And then more recently in Hawaii, such as last year, we passed some groundbreaking national leading legislation on electric cars and vehicles. Um, and so that's tackling down here. This is the fossil transportation side of the picture. And so there's opportunities throughout the Infrastructure Act to tackle all of these chunks of our total energy picture. And with the help of the National Association of State Energy Offices, um, as well as other national organizations, we're reviewing all of the competitive funding opportunities that might be available for the state to pursue to go after these different gaps that people identify. And I put on this chart here some of the highlights. Rose touched on some of these. These are all competitive grants that we will be competing as the state of Hawaii, as local governments in Hawaii, as businesses in Hawaii, with people across the country. And so if we'd like to bring more of the money that's available in the Infrastructure Act to Hawaii, we need to be strategic. We, we need to have strong partnerships and strong proposals. And we're also going to need local matches. The Department of Energy rarely does a competitive grant where they will fully fund the entire effort. Usually they look for 25 to 50 percent of a local match. So if we want to go for a $4 million grant from the Department of Energy for any one of these buckets, we might need up to $2 million of local dollars to be able to provide. What kind of dollars count? Um, in some cases, it's appropriations. It's something that the legislature has already appropriated to fund using our local revenue sources to pay for, in which case we can say that's the local match. The, the state has already committed this much to work on this effort, and we'd like DOE's assistance through this competitive grant opportunity. In other cases, it's, it's revenue that we need to put up, such as through barrel tax dollars, um, to pay for the work, and then we're reimbursed by DOE after the fact. And so we have to have the money up front, but at the end of the day, it's zero for us. Or there's also labor um, and kind matches and other kinds of contributions. And so as we digest the Infrastructure Act and we work with uh, the legislature, we work with Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and our various energy stakeholders, um, we want to be able to provide a consistent, strong, coordinated collaborative application on any competitive grant to the DOE for a way to bring money to the state. So I'll stop there and just want to say again, thank you, uh, Mark and Rick, for organizing this and providing the opportunity to talk about this today. Thank you so much, Scott. I uh, really appreciate the clear view on what's next with the state energy program and the other funding categories, especially like your um, nice graph on the 10 competitive uh, grant funding uh, categories that you listed out and that very clear explanation about the some of the challenges, particularly the matching issues. Uh, all those are things that we're going to need to keep in mind as we move forward. Now we get to move <clears throat> into the exciting sessions where we get to dig deeper on these urgent infrastructure needs and priorities, followed by a robust discussion with all the panelists and our discussants uh, on from the legislature on what are the essential, essential investments that need to be made and what the Energy Policy Forum can do to track the funding opportunities and inform and foster meaningful collaborations. Because as Scott had mentioned, it's really gonna take a very important and, and concentrated effort to be able to compete nationally for these funds. Our first panel will probe Hawaii's needs for grid improvements energy efficiency measures, and energy demonstration projects to address critical infrastructure gaps. We'll follow up that discussion with a candid assessment of resiliency needs in preparation for an increasing probability of extreme weather events and natural disasters that approach our islands each coming year. In the essence of time, I'll briefly provide an introduction to speakers in session 1A before convening the first panel, and then I'll do the same for 1B uh, before their panel. So our first presenter in panel 1B is, will be Dean Nishima, the Executive Director of the State of Hawaii uh, Department of Consumer, and, uh, Consumer Commerce and Consumer Affairs. 
as the state's consumer advocate, Dean and his staff uh, represent regulated utility and transportation consumers before regulatory agencies, such as the Public Utilities Commission. Dean and his team are skilled at understanding the diversity of consumer interests and perspectives. Next is Brian uh, Kehaloa, the Executive Director of Hawaii Energy, who leads the state's administration of the public benefits fee on Hawaiian Electric customer bills. He's been very effective at broadening the approach of reducing energy demand through innovative efficiency strategies. And we'll hear about his leadership on one of the most important electricity generation infrastructure issues facing Honolulu today, among other innovations. Following Brian is Colton Ching, Senior Vice President of uh, Planning and Technology for Hawaiian Electric Company. He has the great distinction of being responsible for nothing less than planning for HECO's 100% renewable energy grid of the future and procuring the cost-effective, reliable, and resilient renewable generation, as well as is the strategy that underlies HECO's investments for transmission and distribution. And then rounding out the panel 1A is Jason Maga, General Manager of Hawaii Fueling Facilities Corporation. While working largely behind the scenes, Jason leads a consortium of 19 airlines uh, that own and operate jet fuel storage facilities throughout Hawaii, including the facilities at Honolulu, Kahului, Lahui, Kona, and Hilo. Dean, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, first off, I'd, I'd like to give my appreciation to Mark and his team for organizing all of this, as well as, you know, Rick and his team for kind of taking in HEPF and, and providing the, the forum through which we can have these discussions. Um, if you can bring up the slide, the, the vision of consumer advocacy is, um, as mentioned, part of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. And we represent the interests of all consumers of regulated utilities and transportation services. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the slides are advancing, but um, uh, if, if we can actually advance to the next slide already as well. So the, uh, just a brief introduction into the industries that are regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. Um, it includes energy, telecommunications, water and wastewater and transportation companies. Um, next slide. Uh, but we're here today to talk about you know, energy issues. And I was asked to speak to energy equity. Um, uh, energy equity. Is, is not a new issue. You know, um, we've been bringing it up for years and a number of other jurisdictions have also been addressing um, energy equity issues. In general, you know, the, the question is, as we continue to progress with our transition to clean energy, is everybody being brought along or are we making the, the gap between the haves and the have nots greater? And, you know, that that's something that, you know, we've been trying to, to raise before the commission as well as other forums in terms of, you know, what can we do to make sure that we don't leave people behind. Um, I, I think it's important to point out that equity issues relate to different aspects of, you know, the provision of service to customers. It's, it's not just bills. Um, as Rose was mentioning earlier, you know, the <clears throat> For, for low income or vulnerable homes, you know, the, the energy bill can represent up to 30 to 40% of, you know, a, a low income household income. And so that's, that's where it's really important to make sure that the choices we're making isn't making the situation worse for those customers where, you know, they have to make decisions about whether or not they're going to spend money to pay their utility bills and have electricity or, or buy food or, you know, to, to buy necessities. So, um, you know, one thing I, I I think it's important to point out, you know, electric utility rates are regressive in the sense that um, the, the the bills for the lower income customers can be, you know, quite burdensome. And, you know, we need to try to figure out ways to reduce that burden for customers. Um, and, you know, I, I think the other thing that really needs to be point, pointed out is as we continue with these transitions, you know, the customers are, are changing. The, their loads are changing. What, what, what they can do to manage their, their loads are changing. And so from that perspective, the low-income customers don't always have the same opportunities in terms of being able to manage their use. And, and that's where, you know, potentially their, um, the, the burden of the energy bill can become greater. Um, I, I think the, it, it's, it's important to point out that, you know, over, over 
the number of years that equity issues have been considered, there have been things to try to address some of those, um, those, those gap issues, um, such as reserving portions of programs for low-income customers. But I feel obligated to point out that, you know, just simply carving out a percentage of a program for low-income customers isn't usually um, a great solution because where these programs require, say, money up front from these low-income customers and then get a rebate later, they may not have the money up front to participate in energy efficiency programs or in distributed energy resource programs. So we, we need to think about other solutions in terms of making sure we're closing that gap so we don't leave these, pe um, these people behind. And, um, you know, besides the bill impact, I, I think it's also important to realize that, you know, these, these um, projects and other things that we're doing can have environmental equity issues as well. Um, for instance, you know, I, I think we're all familiar with respect to, you know, what happened in Kahuku with respect to the wind wind projects and affecting the community where, you know, they were saying basically, you know, we, we had enough. We're okay with the first one, but not the second one. And so, you know, it, we need to be mindful of how these projects, whether they're environment, uh, excuse me, renewable energy projects or even traditional projects can impact those communities. And I, it's, along with the, you know, environmental or geographical equity issues, um, you know, we, we need to ask ourselves, are the, the communities, the vulnerable communities that are rural, do they have the same type of service as it relates to, you know, res resiliency and, and reliability? If, if one distribution line goes down, you know, how quick can, can the company get out there and fix it for them? Or if there's a catastrophe, how long will it take to get the service back up to those remote communities? So uh, th these are some of the equity issues that I just kind of wanted to tee up. And next slide, please. Um, I, I, I'd like to point out, you know, it's, it's not as if we haven't been doing things, you know, there, we are building support for more programs to serve those vulnerable customers. Um, to, to um, Brian's, you know, uh, credit, and as well as the commission who's kind of directed Brian and the Hawaii Energy Program to, to pay more attention to direct more funds to actually address, you know, vulnerable customer needs. Um, you know, we've been doing different things in, in Hawaii and, and similarly in other states, you know, they're also starting to look at these issues as well. So there are similar changes as it relates to energy efficiency and distributed energy resource programs. Some of the other states have actually adopted laws requiring the um, public utility commissions in those jurisdictions to specifically consider equity and inclusion issues. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, and, and as was discussed by, by Mark and, and some of the er earlier speakers, I, I think, you know, with, with this new bill um, and the potential for more funds, there are a lot of opportunities out there, but I'm just wanted to discuss two possible projects or um, potential use for those funds that could address some of these equity issues. So, you know, the first relates to um, what, what some people kind of think about in, in terms of renew renewable energy zones, where if we can, you know, get some funding to help facilitate a community outreach program where we go out to the community and better understand, you know, what their needs and what their acceptance levels might be of, of energy uh, projects in their area, we can vet those things up front to see, you know, what the response might be rather than the way we're doing it now, which is, you know, we have developers kind of find sites that they think might work. And then later on, when the community finds out about these approved power purchase agreements, we, we sometimes have pushback, which leads to a delay in those projects where we have to have contested case hearings and court proceedings as it relates to whether or not those projects can proceed. So, you know, the idea is if we can use some of the uh, available funding to expand and improve on the customer outreach that we have with those communities. And then if there's an approved, using air quotes, approved area that the community is accepting for, we can build infrastructure to facilitate the, the, the construction of projects out there, which could improve the, the timeliness, um, community acceptance, as, as well as a number of factors as it relates to these re renewable energy projects. So this is you know, just one potential idea as it relates to what we can do to address energy equity issues as it relates to communities that feel like they don't have a voice when these projects are being selected. Uh, next slide. The, the other suggestion you know, th that I have, and, and again, you know, these are just two suggestions, but clearly there are many solutions that are out there. And I think, you know, it's important, I, I think, you know, Mark was kind of alluding to this as well as um, Scott. It's important that we start to, you know, have these conversations and, and bring more voices to the table and work collaboratively so that we, we, we as a state can work together to find 
um, opportunities to apply for these funding opportunities. Um, I, and I think, you know, one of the, the funding opportunities relates to grid modernization. And, and that's what, you know, this slide is speaking to in the sense that um, in order to better address some of the low income and vulnerable customer needs, I, I think it's, it's, where we need to get better data and information from those customers as it relates to what those needs are. I think one of the potential, and I don't want to say it's a failing, but you know, one of the earlier programs, they, we have carve outs for them, but we're not really trying to understand what their needs are. And by improving um, the grid and you know, modernizing the grid, we can collect more information to better um, inform our decisions as it relates to changing rate design and how to design energy efficiency programs to meet those needs. But I think, you know, I feel obligated to, to point out one of the things we really need to do is really start to build more, um, again, in, in establishing the, those outreach, building trust and confidence with those communities, because, um, you know, it, it's a constant refrain from, you know, the communities as it relates, you know, we've been left out, we haven't had a voice in the table. And, you know, when we come up with a program and we say, well, but here, look, you can participate in these programs. But then, you know, the response is, well, that, that doesn't help us any. So, you know, I, I think it's important, again, for us to look for opportunities to improve on that outreach. And in modernizing the grid, we can do it in a way that helps to improve on the reliability and resiliency for the vulnerable communities, as well as helping them to, to manage their energy burden. So I, I think with that, you know, again, I, I think uh, again, many, many more opportunities. These are two that I think, you know, two quick hits that I think everybody agrees on. So if, you know, we can work together to help see if we can get some of that funding to really jumpstart these things, it'll be really important. Um, and then I think the next slide is maybe my, my Mahalo slide. So, you know, with that, again, I, I want to thank uh, Mark and, and, and Rick for the opportunity to speak on this, these issues. And hopefully, you know, we will start to pay more attention to these equity issues in a manner that includes you know, these communities rather than just kind of talking about them and creating these carve outs. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dean, um, especially for, you know, taking the leadership on uh, such an important subject that, uh, you know, as, as you pointed out, that has not been uh, completely overlooked, but perhaps it hasn't been received as much attention as it should uh, throughout the years. We can dig into your two your several uh, recommendations in the dialogue section. Section. We'll move on now quickly to uh, Brian Kailoa. Hello, Mark. I'm Mahalo to Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, obviously, for uh, hosting this and putting together uh, this discussion, which I think is extremely valuable to um, discuss. You know, what I'm going to be talking about today is how energy efficiency can really help uh, drive some of the future retirements of, of fossil fuel generators. Because as Scott Glenn didn't say today, but he'll often talk about um, from a standpoint of what we need to do as a state is we're going to be retiring units every couple of years. And so um, if we can go to the next slide here. Re you know, Rose provided, and so did Scott, provide a really great overview of the funding that's uh, being provided through the Infrastructure Act. So I'm not going to over uh, emphasize maybe some of the things that we talked about, but I do want to highlight a couple of areas that we're very excited about. Rose spoke a little bit about the weatherization assistance program and that funding is already starting to come down to states. And why that's important is to the point that uh, Dean was just making is that our low and moderate income customers are facing much higher energy burdens than, than other customers. And so making sure that this funding is becoming available quickly for them to be able to, to pay their bills and be more um, fiscally resilient is super important. Along those lines, um, we do see that across the rest of this funding area that, that it can help with the current situation we're facing with the AES retirement of the coal plant. Um, you know, Rick talked about the importance of energy efficiency in our 100% renewable um, march, but you know, especially on Oahu where we are land constrained and there may, may be better uh, uses for that land, we have to start funding more investments in efficiency. And that's why we're so excited about this infrastructure act because um, it's much needed and much overdue because it is the cheapest and easiest path for us to get there. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to highlight on this is that, you know, we are excited as well about the, the energy efficiency revolving loan grant program. We feel like that can spur and help some of the challenges that Dean just pointed out about the, that first cost for energy efficiency. So how do we leverage um, this funding along with GEMS and be able to, to drive more of those opportunities for low income customers? Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. As we heard earlier, competitive grants are a big piece of, of the formula. And I think there's been already a trend and discussion about how we need to collaborate and work together on that. 
speak to that a little bit more in a bit, but um, as highlighted by Rose, one of the biggest opportunities that we saw for energy efficiency is this grant, uh, excuse me, yes, yeah, competitive grant for public school facilities, over $500 million is available, as well as this energy efficiency materials pilot program, which targets nonprofit customers. Uh, we've run a similar program over the past two years, energy relief grant, uh, empower grant, and this specifically targeted small businesses and nonprofits. So we see this pairing nicely with our existing programs because as Scott mentioned, one of the key criteria for this is gonna be what matching funds are available. And so we see this as a really exciting opportunity to maybe eliminate the entire cost for nonprofits to drive energy efficiency. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, so pairing nicely with the schools program uh, and the nonprofits program is the energy auditor training grant program, uh, $40 million potentially available. Uh, this is to create certified energy auditors. And as we look at developing our clean energy workforce, um, and we're going to need to have audits done of these schools and of these nonprofits, having a, a really a flow for people to see that there's opportunities to take this training, to get certification, to spend the time and investment and have work on the other side is really the, the exciting part of what we're seeing coming from this funding. Uh, additionally, you know, the work and the funding around energy codes, I think we often overlook that. Um, they provide significant energy savings when buildings are constructed. Um, not only do they reduce the, um, well, they especially reduce the cost of, for Hawaii's families that are struggling with the high cost of living. With, you know, an energy burden of 30%, uh, we need to make sure that these buildings aren't being built to the lowest standard, but we're actually raising it to a much higher standard that will create more, in, uh, you know, less cost and you know, obviously more disposable income for our low and, and moderate income families. But we often hear a lot of misinformation when codes are, are being worked on and, and trying to be, be passed. But I'm here to tell you today that uh, one of the greatest opportunities that we have is to shore up our new construction and moving that bar and driving the long-term costs for our residents down so that they can stay here. Next slide, please. So transitioning a little bit from the federal funding and, and moving into uh, some of the programs that Hawaii Energy is doing specifically to address some of the ongoing needs to reduce immediately KW and KWH, uh, we've launched our, our Power Move program. Uh, and this was stood up really in response to the PUC's request to reduce demand in the five to nine period. Uh, next slide, please. So our Power Move program is a limited time program, which is made up of two key pieces. The first is the demand savings bonus, which provides $400 in, save, in, in rebate for a KW that's reduced in the 5 to 9 p.m. period. So by way of comparison, our typical rebate is $125. Uh, we see growing opportunity in bi-level lighting, other lighting controls, smarter building management systems, refrigeration controls, just to name a few. But these measures are much more costly. They're not the low hanging fruit. And coupled with the challenging business environment that we're in, um, many of these investments are being deferred. And so we need greater incentives and funding to accelerate business investment into energy efficiency and get these upgrades done now so it can help address the situation. And we're hoping that Power Move is one component of being able to do that. Uh, next slide, please. The second piece is our commercial battery storage program, which will obviously target target commercial storage facilities. Uh, based on extensive engagement with customers and industry, we see that there are opportunities beyond HECO's battery bonus program. Uh, we have been working with HECO to ensure that our program meets the overall objectives and not be a duplicative rebate, but the idea is really to be able to stack energy efficiency and load shifting to maximize peak load reduction through 2023 and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. As I wrap up here, a uh, couple of things. One, I just wanted to show, I think oftentimes, uh, you know, Scott had a good slide of just, you know, energy waste in general and, and what's going into some of that energy waste. This shows, uh, you know, over the past five years that there's been significant energy waste that we've been able to reclaim a little bit. Um, and, and if we can accelerate these efforts and increase investment into this, um, that we are gonna be able to help with the offsetting, not only of, again, of the AES plant, of a future plants. So when we look, over the course of a given year, we average 19 to 26 megawatt reduction in just from energy efficiency. So um, we're excited about the IJA and being able to really uh, accelerate those efforts. Uh, next slide, please. So to wrap up, uh, I don't wanna be the dead horse, but I think it's really important to, 
to talk about that we need to work together on this and and by that is not work against each other i think there is going to be a lot of funding available and a lot of interests that are, are going to be coming to the table to pursue this funding um we're i think excited about the opportunity to work with the energy policy forum to see this as being an area to obviously collaborate and bring innovative solutions to the table uh, in conjunction with the state energy office and the coordination that they're doing, I think is really important. Um, secondly, uh, you know, Rose touched on, on this a, a little bit and we were already seeing it for some of the transportation programs, but RFIs are coming out. Um, there's opportunities to inform with the program design and the requirements. So making sure that we're bringing our ideas to the table to have things structured in a way that's most favorable for, for Hawaii being able to leverage this funding. And then lastly, I just wanted to touch on the importance of, of that matching funding. Scott touched on that already today, but if, if we can leverage existing programs and bring some of those matching funding to the table, it highly uh, increases our chances to be able to receive these competitive grants. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity today and look forward to continued discussion. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, yeah, really great points. And again, we'll elaborate a little bit. We can dig deeper on these as we get into the dialogue. Excellent, John. Uh, now we move directly into uh, Colton Ching's discussion. Colton. Thank you, Mark. Uh, aloha and good morning, everyone. Um, if we can bring up my slide, I, I'll, I'll cover just one slide for, for my piece. Um, and and kind of want to take the discussion back a little bit to the broader opportunity that at least we see uh, for the IJA. Um, you know, Rose and Scott, and my fellow pal panelists have already given, I think, a pretty good background at how the opportunity works. Um, but I wanted to talk about what Hawaiian Electric has already been doing and what we've already been learning about the federal funding opportunity and kind of give a comprehensive view of how we see it. So first of all, you know, this, this is something that began for us even before the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act or IIJA was finalized, right? We kind of knew in general what was coming. And we, so we began working on identifying what those opportunities uh, could be to apply federal funds to both our current work that we're doing here in Hawaii, as well as potential future work that we've been thinking about and planning for as well. And really focus on things that were very well aligned with the intent and objective of, of IIJA, which is, around making Hawaii more renewable, making it more reliable, making it more resilient, uh, as well as making the state more economically and societally, societally sustainable. Um, they lined up really, really well, right? And so we began conversations both internally within our organization and externally uh, with the state and many other partners to better understand uh, how others are thinking about this, uh, to better identify additional opportunities and ways to, to take advantage of, of this sort of a once in a generation um, uh, federal funding opportunity. So immediately, you know, just right, right off of the boat, right out of the gates, we, we saw a lot of common outcomes and, and objectives between IJ and what Hawaii as a state, we already had established uh, for ourselves, right, as our goals, uh, and, and our needs. And, and Dean and Brian, I think, gives a couple of good examples of things that we have already are doing or things that are already underway that we saw a great opportunity to apply federal funding for. But as Rose and as Scott, and as I think Mark mentioned as well, um, this federal process is competitive, right? It's not one where we put our hand out and say, we're Hawaii. Uh, we can make good use of the money, right? Notwithstanding uh, the $20 billion that, that Scott uh, made reference to, uh, it's a very competitive process. Uh, and part of getting ready uh, is really about making sure that as a state, we can put ourselves in the most competitive position to get as much of the funding that we can. Because I think as we all kind of understand what IJ is looking to do. We see and hear Hawaii ideas, Hawaii objectives throughout it, right? So how do we make ourselves competitive in this process? It was one of the things we identified early as something we need to solve for. Okay, so on the uh, further down on the left side of, of my slide, you know, what are the things we've learned along the way since we started on this uh, last year? 
Um, first of all, you know, as the title says, you know, we've been identifying opportunities for both our traditional or sector roles in energy, but we also saw a lot of opportunities where Hawaii Electric has, I think, an important collaborative role uh, across government, across uh, other organizations as well. So you see I have a list here on the left with some of the specific drivers and factors uh, that we've identified, right? Uh, where we can put ourselves in a good place to either uh, be uh, a, sort of the lead in taking advantage of the, of the funding or to be a very uh, important supporter or collaborative partner with, with others. And our climate change action plan, I think is a good example of what we're doing to both mitigate and adapt to climate change, uh, very much aligned uh, for the state, right? The early uh, and sort of um, nationally, maybe globally leading um, policy around setting 100% renewable portfolio standards. Uh, our island state isolation that we kind of take for granted is sort of known or sort of the life that we live is I think gives us an opportunity to demonstrate how important it is for island communities like ours to really lead this effort. Uh, and things like electrification of transportation, that's been a focus mentioned earlier already uh, by Scott, uh, equitable energy access that several of, uh, of the speakers have already talked about. But also things like the fact that Hawaii is the home to a very critical piece of our military's portfolio of, of capabilities to base resources and project uh, uh, peace and security throughout, throughout the globe. Uh, and I think that gives us a competitive edge uh, as we think about the things that we do and the way we can seek funding for a lot of what we do. And then like as others have already talking about economic uh, benefits and job diversification, uh, although this may not be on, a, on the on the surface or the top of a list of things becomes an underlying key foundational objective across all of the things that we do, right? So that those are things that we already are starting to see as synergies, benefits and edges that we have uh, as we look for opportunities as a state uh, to get uh, as much as we can from, from IJA. Um, Speaking specifically for the utility and energy sector, there are some categories where we see a lot of overlap in there. Uh, those four key areas uh, are sort of summarized uh, on the right. They're listed in the middle and, and, and uh, Dean and Brian have already listed actually some of those categories. But when we take all of those specific funding categories and we overlay it on some key areas of focus, uh, we really see opportunities around grid resilience, uh, and, and Rick Pinkerton will be um, talking more about that um, in the next panel. But it's also things like grid flexibility, right? grid modernization that Dean spoke about, but it's also the renewable energy, low carbon resources that we want to add to our system. And as Mark spoke to, we want to make, make sure that we don't just have the clean resources, right? the zero carbon renewable resources you want to have, but we have the grid that is able to connect them, make use of them, and ultimately use those clean resources to serve our customers, whether they're large resources or whether they're small distributed resources. We need to make sure that the grid uh, is adapted, transformed, and changed to really serve in this kind of different role. And capping all of that, maybe overlying all of that is flexibility in the resources that we have, whether it's flexible large scale generation resources, flexible small scale resources, including batteries that, that Brian spoke about, but it's also flexible loads, right? Making uh, the energy that we use and the power and electricity demand that, that all of our customers use and all of us as residents of the state of Hawaii use, how do we make those resources and the ability to change and adjust their usage more beneficial to the electric system? And, and Dean touched a little bit upon that. Uh, charging infrastructure, you can think about it as part of the grid, but part of the grid that is serving a new role that the grid never had to do before, which is to provide power and energy in a reliable and resilient way to decarbonize the transportation oh. sector. Uh, and Aki will be coming on later this morning to talk about a bit about that. 
And then last but not least, this sort of term called middle mile broadband, which maybe not all of us are familiar with, but to do all of the three things that I spoke about just now requires telecommunications, ability for smart devices, whether they're ours or our partners or our customers' devices to all talk to each other and, and coordinate their operations in a way that's beneficial to the system. And if we're going to establish um, added communications capabilities throughout the grid, we see a lot of opportunities to not just do it just for ourselves, but to do it in a way that supports other more broader telecommunication benefits uh, in the state of Hawaii, such as broadband, you know, getting broadband access for remote learning, for remote working. You can think about all of the benefits uh, high-speed broadband throughout the state uh, can have from a, an economic standpoint. So that's how we've been looking at it. Um, I know we're Hawaiian Electric. You think of us as an electric utility, but we've really been looking at IJA from the perspective of what we can do broadly to either directly or in a supportive role, make Hawaii as accessible as we can to get uh, as much of the federal funding as we can, and then apply it in a way most efficiently, uh, most equitably to all of, uh, all of us that call Hawaii home. So with that, Mark, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Colton. Yeah, I mean, did a really good job of, of explaining the complexity of the integrated business system and energy and, and all the pieces that we could really begin to uh, focus on with this infrastructure funding. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the jet fuel piece, obviously a, a massive part, important part of our economy since we're in this remote location. Uh, Jason Maga, floor is yours. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you and all the participants uh, of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and for inviting me to, to speak. Um, one thing that you're probably going to expect is that I'm going to talk about, um, you know, jet fuel and possibly sustainable jet fuel. I'm actually not going to be talking about that today. I'm not personally involved um, with any kind of sustainable jet fuel, um, you know, uh, initiatives at this point. However, um, with jet fuel use growing throughout the state, uh, what I will be focusing on is supply logistics and how we can actually possibly reduce some of the ground fuels um, that you know, supply the airports uh, with the jet fuel. So um, if I go over to my slides, it should be pretty quick. Uh, this is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, if you go down to the next slide, um, we're going to start uh, with the Kahului Airport in, in Maui. And if you just go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so you'll see here, uh, again, just some stats. Uh, an increase um, of 30%. Uh, over the past five years and 61% increase um, in demand uh, over the past 10 years since 2011. Um, on a day on a day to day basis uh, for 2021, that was an average of 31 truckloads a day um, with peak season truckloads over the holidays uh, just recently being approximately 38 and actually over 40 trucks a day um, on certain days. So uh, again, lots of trucks going back and forth from the terminal to the, far, from a harbor terminal to the airport. Um, again, it's, it's, it's not a long distance. It's only 1.5 miles along the right of way. Um, so where's the opportunity here um, to put in some infrastructure to take those, those trucks off the road? A 1.5 mile pipeline that could be constructed uh, for common use by both of the suppliers at the uh, harbor um, would obviously significantly, either significantly reduce um, and possibly just completely eliminate uh, that, that off airport trucking uh, from the terminals to the airport. So again, reducing the, the consumption of ground fuels um, in this instance uh, with something that is a, a very doable, um, you know, and, and you know, hopefully we could get some funding uh, through this uh, program. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the next item I'll go on to is the Kona International Airport. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I'll have very similar um, statistics. But uh, as you'll see, uh, a lot more growth uh, in the Kona Airport. Uh, annual usage uh, for 2021 was 44 million gallons uh, total for the year. Uh, that's an increase of 69% compared to five years ago. Um, and an 83% increase uh, since 2011. So again, uh, significant increases in, in usage 
um, and therefore a significant increase in the number of truckloads required per day uh, to get that fuel from a harbor terminal uh, to the airport. Um, now with the distance from a harbor terminal to the airport uh, in, in, on the Big Island, um, you know, a pipeline is, is not really a, a, a foreseeable uh, item, but what we could do is currently about, um, about 11 truckloads a day uh, are coming from Hilo, right? So they're coming all the way over from, from Hilo Harbor, making an 85, 80 to 95 mile drive, um, where if they were able to expand some of their terminal storage at Kauai High Harbor, um, you could reduce that by 70%, the distance, right? It's about uh, a third of the distance from Kauai High Harbor down to the airport to deliver fuel. So, um, you know, 70% of those truckloads uh, could come from a distance that was much closer, obviously reducing, um, you know, the amount of time that they're spending on the road uh, and the emissions of those truckloads. Um, so, that is the end of my presentation. Again, uh, small small things, uh, you know, within the the overall aviation fuel industry that we could do, but um, a couple of things that I think we could get done pretty easily and pretty quickly. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, obviously, congestion mitigation and uh, air air quality improvements uh, from ground transportation are not not a minor thing. So, um, really interesting uh, for you to point out those particular issues and. We'll, we'll discuss those. Uh, please continue to write your questions uh, for session 1A and the upcoming session 1B until after the conclusion of the next four presentations. And then we'll engage in a moderated dialogue to an, identify or to further discuss these high priority gaps and needs and how the forum can support and coordinate the critical follow-up to ensure that these opportunities aren't missed uh, clearly, as, as the speakers have been uh, encouraging us to do. Uh, now we'll move directly into session 1B. And I'm going to uh, introduce um, the, the speakers who will talk about resiliency. Um, our first presenter is David Lopez, the executive officer of uh, Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. He's one of the most qualified personnel we've ever had in the job with more than 20 years of experience in international crisis management. Hawaii has benefited from threat mitigation plans and response plans developed by David, and he's led effective responses to critical events ranging from hurricanes, aircraft disasters, and terrorist incidents. Following David is Kevin Nishimura, Vice President of Operations from, at Hawaii Gas. He started his career with, in Hawaii, with Hawaii Gas in 1993, as a staff engineer, he's worked his way through uh, the ranks in all the areas, including engineering operations, customer care, and strategic initiatives. Our resilience panel also includes, as Colton pointed out, Rick Pinkerton. He's the director of asset planning and strategy at Hawaiian Electric. He's responsible for all the HECO strategies, work plans, and budgets for ongoing maintenance uh, and renewable, the transportation and distribution system as well as it enhancements to grid reliability and resilience. He's also responsible for the internal and external reporting on system reliability and resilience metrics. So when you get those reports on Sadie and Safi, uh, I'm sure that's Rick Pinkerton's fingerprints all over that. Our final speaker in this panel is Chris Junker, who leads the resiliency, clean transportation and analytics team at the Hawaii State Energy Office. His team's now tasked with challenging analysis uh, to understand how Hawaii's integrated utility grids, pipelines, fuels, and energy inf infrastructure can sequester more atmospheric carbon and greenhouse gases. And it emits no later than 2045, but hopefully sooner. But I have to point out that uh, Chris and, of course, Scott Glenn's important longstanding re responsibility is the Energy Office's oversight of emergency, um, state emergency support function 12 which supports the Department of, Hawaii, of Homeland Security in Hawaii in prioritizing the reestablishment of critical infrastructure after emergency event. So David, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Can everyone hear me? Good. Yeah, okay. we can hear Thank you. you. Great. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, of course, on behalf of Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, um, we thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. 
oftentimes we're not included in these discussions, so we really appreciate it. As, as Mark said, I'm the executive officer at Hawaii Emergency Management, and um, he tasked me with giving you a candid appraisal and straight talk on resiliency. And you know, fortunately, I get pretty high marks in candor, uh, but we run the risk of, of probably making a few people mad in, in the meantime. But we're going to run that risk today, and so I'm going to give you kind of our perspective on how we see some of these things. Um, not only in energy, but in, in, in infrastructure in general. Um, so basically I'm gonna to touch on four topics, uh, system redundancy, transition and integration of systems, holistic planning and affordability. And from what I've heard so far is we've kind of run in and out of those subjects already too. So you'll get the, again, the, the emergency management perspective. So we've also heard a lot of talk on climate change and what we're gonna do in the next 50 years. Um, but a lot of times our concerns don't, don't match our actions. And the truth is, is that there's been minimal investment by the state in regard to resiliency and protecting its critical systems from natural disasters and, and other disasters as well. But we have a, aging infrastructure um, as an example. And even though it's pretty unique, the, the Haima facility is located in a 1908 era bunker and uh, kind of give, put some perspective on things. We're still undergoing lead, lead abatement, lead paint abatement. So it kind of lays a little perspective there. Um, along with aging infrastructure, we have single points of failure throughout our critical systems. Uh, Port of Honolulu is a single point of failure. Its commercial capability can't be replicated in any other commercial port. Um, we have an on-demand e economy, with, which lends to having no surplus storage. And with the, you know, with only a few exceptions, like the fuel reserves at our power plants, you know, um, there's not a lot of built up storage for emergency. And so, of course, in most systems, this leads to a single point of failure. If you took, take our food and water system and, and look at that storage, um, in general, we just have about three to four days of on hand food or, and water supply throughout the state should, should we lose importation. So it kind of, again, gives you perspective. Um, we're down to one oil refinery. So we, again, single point of, of failure there. Um, we don't have a lot of geographical redundancy in some key infrastructure, meaning that we have all our eggs in one basket, basically all located in one spot. Um, we have many pieces of critical infrastructure and in inundation zones. <clears throat> the energy sector reaches into every critical system we have and we need a variety of those sources for emergency power. And this variety will be key to provide response and recovery in emergency circumstances. We simply aren't prepared for a minor catastrophic event, not to mention a major event with cascading effects that would cross multiple system failures. Uh, redundancy and alternative emergency planning has never been really a strong point in the state planning process. And our geographic isolation alone should have spawned this type of thinking years ago. So we have some catching up to do there. <clears throat> These problems are exacerbated by transitioning and integrating new components into old systems. Today we're talking about energy. I mean, thank God, I'm glad we are. I'm glad we're part of it, but we should take this approach to every critical system we, we intend to upgrade. Um, for us in emergency management, we always have to find two solutions to every pro every problem and disaster hands us. Um, we have to fix the broken system, but you have to do something in the meantime. You have to have an interim fix or work around or people will die. Hurricane Maria demonstrated this in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was transitioning and integrating their energy system, but they didn't have a catastrophic failure plan. They didn't understand their capabilities and limitations of power system integration from that old to the new, and especially in austere catastrophic conditions. The loss of their power system created cascading effects. They didn't understand those either. And it ultimately led to a prolonged recovery. So a year after Maria's landfall, their death toll still rose to 3,000 people. Hawaii is not that different from Puerto Rico. We have aging infrastructure, energy system transitions. We're integrating new with old. We're both island states, of course. We have a mountain range that separates power sources from population centers. 
Um, we have single points of failure and we have geographic isolation like they did. Our geographic isolation is double the straight line distance as their, theirs is from help though. The last similarity is the in inability or a failure to plan holistically across systems. Until 2016, Hawaii, like Puerto Rico, planned in, what in emergency management we call silos of excellence. Um, our emergency management system was much the same way. But as you can see from this panel, these issues are much bigger than any one organization. They exceed the expertise of any one organization and the budget of any one organization as well. So the silo, silo planning prevents that systematic recovery. It prevents mutually supporting plans that provide efficiency in the order of operations when stress is put across systems and it delays recovery. No system in our island state works independently of another. They're all connected, they all have interdependencies and therefore cascading effects when they begin to fail. And we have to assume at some point they will fail. We should plan an environment which we will, you know, in which we will respond to. Planning holistically across systems ties and improves our systems where they intersect. It allows a wider variety of experts to factor in redundancy and alternative plans to address these cascading effects and limit human suffering when systems do fail. Holistic planning also aids in affordability. Our critical systems are complex, interdependent beasts. They're expensive to build, maintain and protect. Holistic planning brings a multi-system approach to issues where the increase of stakeholders broadens that expertise, protections and defers cost. This not only makes systems more affordable to develop, but it increases the affordability to the everyday citizen. And if our citizens can't afford the use of systems in the best conditions, then they surely not be able to use those systems in exigent circumstances when they're needed the most. From the emergency management perspective, redundancy can be accomplished with capital improvement projects, especially now around the port, um, port infrastructure, alternate port capabilities, emergency ration warehouses across the state. And of course, with every one of these key pieces of, in, of infrastructure, they have to be accompanied with alternate power resources. The proper transition and integration of new technologies to old with the application of emergency recovery should be explored. This way Hawaii understands how to put itself back together in the event of a catastrophic strike during system modernization. Holistic mitigation planning incorporates that philosophy of addressing interdependencies and cascading effects across the systems. And of course, this increases the overall resiliency. It broadens that area of the areas of expertise and especially makes things affordable to our citizens. <clears throat> That's why emergencies management's perspective. Um, and we, we do again, thank you for allowing us to share this. David, thank you uh, for that candid appraisal. And uh, obviously something that we'll be following up with uh, in the discussion. Uh, thanks so much. We'll move uh, directly into uh, Kevin Nishimura right now. Thank you, Mark. And I appreciate the opportunity um, from you and your group to uh, participate in this important conversation today. Um, at Hawaii Gas, you know, we, we uh, have resilience in our DNA. Um, for us, it means um, two huge components. And one is, um, as um, David pointed out, it's redundancy in systems. Uh, the other is diversification. So a lot of the investments that we're putting into our infrastructures um, are to enhance uh, both redundancy um, and diversity. Um, you know, although Hawaii gas um, accounts for just uh, under 1% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Hawaii, we're as committed as the rest of the state to reduce that um, contribution to greenhouse gases. Um, a lot of the projects and initiatives we're working on uh, involve increasing um, locally sourced RNG to replace um, SNG. And we're also looking at um, locally produced um, opportunities for hydrogen. Uh, I know Rose mentioned it in her presentation that hydrogen blending um, nationwide is becoming a very hot topic um, for utilizing gas pipelines to distribute hydrogen. Um, and she said in, in these <clears throat> pilot projects, there has to be a first. Um, Hawaii Gas was the first and is the only 
um, utility in the States right now to distribute um, a blended hydrogen methane um, product to our customers. We've done that for uh, over four decades now. Um, with that, we're getting a lot of attention. Um, there's probably opportunities for us to leverage that attention with investment in um, research on our pipeline and our systems. Uh, we've been working with a number of developers and groups, um, you know, very interested in, in Hawaii gas and what we're doing with hydrogen blending. Um, we want to expand on that. Uh, one of the key uh, initiatives for, you know, the RNG and the hydrogen projects is to get more locally produced um, energy supply into our portfolio, uh, whether it be from wastewater or solid waste or landfills or even bio crops. Uh, the key here is to contribute to um, a circular economy, as you say, where um, we become more uh, independent. And, you know, uh, and as David pointed out, pointed out, you know, everything that comes to Hawaii comes to our ports. Uh, what we don't want is that single point of failure. So the more we can um, rely on locally sourced and locally produced supply and um, sources of energy, I think you know that that um, feeds into our resilience model, which is which is key here in this conversation. Uh, and we've been investing quite a bit of our energy on on these initiatives. Uh, so regarding. Um, Resilience during natural disasters, and you know, I, I echo um, the things that David said. Uh, when we look at natural uh, natural disasters and, and the recovery for um, you know Hawaii, any of the islands in Hawaii, what we what we consider is um, what are the alternative or redundant systems that we have in place uh, to provide energy to key uh, critical infrastructure like hospitals or shelters in the event of say a hurricane. Um, having um, grid power, having pipeline distribution of energy, uh, as well as um, uh, road transport of energy. Um, all these three alternatives all feed into um, greater diversity and, and again, uh, reinforces resilience. So I think, you know, we're all at this table um, discussing common goals. Um, Again, you know, I think David hit it on the head is we need to have a holistic approach. We need to come together on this uh, and agree on, on what the priorities um, were the most productive um, uh, spend is for our efforts and our, our uh, money. And, you know, I think pulling this firm together and getting uh, the right decision makers um, together is, is, is a great start. So again, that's um, where we are at Hawaii Gas. We're, um, you know, engaged. We are um, actively involved in, in a lot of these initiatives and we're here to, uh, to work together on this. So thank you again, Mark, and appreciate the opportunity. Excellent, Kevin, really appreciate that. We'll move uh, directly into uh, Rick, Rick Pinkerton, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Uh, aloha and good morning to everyone. I just have uh, three slides uh, to highlight some priorities for us and our stakeholders and how uh, this fits with IIJ to kind of add to some of what Colton uh, covered. So uh, uh, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so for Hawaiian Electric, uh, resilience and climate uh, change adaptation efforts started with uh, extensive uh, community and stakeholder engagement. Uh, we've had multi-year and ongoing collaborate, uh, collaborative efforts uh, to discuss resilience capabilities, vulnerabilities, and priorities with many of our key customers, community leaders, first responders, other cr critical community lifelines, uh, and lots of folks uh, speaking in this forum today. Uh, it's included uh, Koalau Poco Community Resilience Initiative and also our Integrated Grid Planning Resilience Working Group. Um, yeah, and throughout uh, this engagement process, one of the key messages uh, that we've heard loud and clear from this group is that electric power is critical, and that energy is the lifeline to other community lifelines, and that Hawaiian Electric must build greater resilience into its power system so we can better withstand severe events, including weather-related disasters, and enable faster recovery. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, as a result, and uh, subject to our Public Utility Commission approval, Hawaiian Electric plans to implement significant resilience enhancements over the next five years that will reduce the severity of damage to our grid when major events do happen 
and allow us to uh, service to be restored to customers more quickly. Uh, we can't harden everything. Our electric grid was built over many decades, um, but the recommendations coming out of this process have helped us tremendously in identifying uh, resilience investments that are very targeted uh, to, to address the highest value projects that will address the biggest vulnerabilities in the most cost-effective way. I uh, also want to point out, I'm going to run through these really quickly, but just want to point out you know, this initial five-year program is not intended to represent the entirety of necessary re resilience initiatives, uh, but would result in significant progress on foundational elements. Um, so um, among you know, specific projects to be proposed by Hawaiian Electric in our application, uh, you know, strengthening our most critical transmission lines to withstand extreme wind, also bolstering our distribution line serving critical community lifelines like ports, major hospitals, military facilities, communications infrastructure, water, wastewater plants, uh, and emergency response services. A lot of what we're hearing, you know, in this forum. Um, also, uh, you know, hard, uh, hardening targeted uh, utility poles that could otherwise significantly impede or delay restoration efforts. You know, it, for these, think of like uh, our facilities crossing highways, uh, multiple circuit poles with key equipment, automated uh, switches, uh, poles that are hard to access with this type of equipment that will really uh, be a bear if they come down uh, during these storms and, and really uh, delay restoration. Also, uh, enhanced vegetation management. Uh, to prevent trees from falling into our lines from the storm. You know, this is in addition to what we already do. Uh, and this is to augment that. Uh, you know, this is about uh, dead, diseased trees, uh, even some healthy invasive species that are outside of our maintenance zone or right away that uh, during, you know, some of these big wind events, uh, they, they can come down and uh, take down our facilities and cause a lot of damage. Uh, also, uh, wildfire mitigation. Uh, uh, we want to strengthen lines and deploy uh, certain protective devices and, and situational awareness devices uh, to prevent both the ignition of wildfires and also to help us withstand damage from wildfires ignited from any source. Also, you know, with the, the recent Kona Low, it kind of reemphasized and highlighted uh, uh, the damaging effects of flooding and heavy rains. Uh, we want to install uh, equipment uh, in some of our potentially vulnerable substations to reduce uh, flood impacts. Also, at a very initial and targeted effort, we want to uh, look at moving some selected lines underground that are currently overhead that are that are prone to uh, damage from falling trees, you know, despite our best efforts <laughs> to manage the vegetation. And then lastly, uh, we want to install distribution feeder ties at some of the isolated substations uh, that allow uh, them to be restored more quickly. This is really about, uh, you know, what we've heard from uh, some of, uh, from uh, David and, and Kevin about uh, redundancy so that we don't have a single point of failure. Uh, yeah, so very important. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so how, how does this fit with IIJA? Colton, as I said, Colton already uh, covered some of this. So I'll just highlight a few points uh, specific to resilience. Uh, so for resilience, we, we think it aligns very well. Uh, there's a compelling need as others have mentioned too, uh, you know, extreme weather events are expected to increase in frequency, intensity, and duration due to climate change. Uh, a lot of what I just described is about uh, installing stronger poles, steel structures, uh, uh, new equipment. A, uh, a lot of that, probably most of that's made in America. Uh, and this, this is, you know, significant work in addition to what we, we routinely do each year. Uh, uh, so uh, we're talking about you know, potentially significant, uh, you know, jobs, additional jobs here, which is, I know is a big objective. Um, also, you know, we're already far along on our PUC application uh, for, for what I've described, actually in the final stages of development. So uh, this comes at a good time. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, and, and I already mentioned, you know, the, how we started with the stakeholder engagement, you know, from the start, we've had in-depth and, you know, ongoing engagement and collaboration with stakeholders. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's key and important. Um, and, uh, you know, a few things uh, mentioned there, you know, there's some additional resilience opportunities, you know, we're looking at uh, that are at various stages. Uh, so, you know, you'll be hearing more in the coming weeks as we prepare and file our application with the PUC. Uh, you know, clearly, you know, we think this is something that's very important to Hawaii. Uh, we're all, you know, we're in this together. 
we need to continue supporting each other and coordinating our efforts uh, to make this happen. So thank you. And uh, thank you, Mark, and the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And uh, I'll head it back to you. Thank you, Rick. Great summary. Um, we'll move uh, quickly into Chris Junker because after his dis brief discussion, we will go into this sort of joint dialogue and we'll try to set aside 15 minutes, which will put us uh, delay our entry into Senator Wakai's discussion, but uh, we should have enough. I wanna make sure that we have enough time to, to really carry on a discussion about these important issues. Uh, Chris, floor is yours. There we go. Two years of uh, COVID and I still can't work on you. Um, hi, Chris Junker, Managing Director of Resilience, Clean Transportation and Analytics at the Hawaii State Energy Office. I'm here today to provide a little background on the Energy Office's role as primary and coordinating agency for the Emergency Support Function 12, ESF 12, which is energy and how ESF 12 informs our perspective on investments and resiliency. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you know, Hawaii is the most isolated population center on the planet. This makes us uniquely vulnerable and drives a need for self-sufficiency. Uh, that need for self-sufficiency makes energy resiliency all the more important. Uh, as I mentioned, the Energy Office is the primary coordinating agency for energy, and this covers all energy, electricity, as well as liquid fuels and gas. Uh, as the primary agency, the Energy Office serves as a subject matter expert for energy within the emergency response framework, and uh, as the core Coordinating agency, the Energy Office has management oversight of the ESF 12 function throughout an event. Uh, our main, our, our role is to maintain situational awareness in order to respond to requests for information and requests for assistance uh, from counties, state agencies, federal agencies, uh, and the private sector. Uh, next slide, please. FEMA's national response framework includes 15 emergency support functions overall. Uh, of those 15, seven have been identified as community lifelines. And uh, community lifelines um, are the fundamental services that allow all other aspects of society to function. So energy is a community lifeline as it is effectively the lifeblood for all activities. And I think that you've heard that from several speakers earlier. Um, and this is an important point. Um, the dependence on energy drives a holistic perspective for the energy office. Energy resiliency is not about resiliency for energy's sake. It's about how energy resiliency can power the critical services that communities need to respond to and rapidly recover uh, from all hazard events. Uh, next slide, please. And the point of this slide is just that time is critical. Um, in many instances, such as hurricane, hurricanes, uh, the clock starts before the event even happens, and that's when the ports close. Uh, at that point, we begin to drain whatever reserves are available on island. Um, we need to be self-sufficient in critical services for as long as we can in order to provide time for resources and assistance to reach us. Uh, energy resiliency investments are just that. There are investments to extend the time that Hawaii can continue to provide critical services to our communities. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this holistic perspective on energy's role can be seen in our activities, uh, which reflect how we would approach future opportunities, such as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, (EJA), uh, FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, BRIC, uh, as well as other funding opportunities. So there are planning grants, and planning grants are used to inform infrastructure investments that will ultimately be made. In many instances, projects identified in planning grants receive extra points in awarding competitive grants, uh, and you've heard that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of competitive funds out there and it's going to be competitive to get them. Uh, so in terms of planning grants, uh, HSEO is a partner uh, in DOT Airport's BRIC application uh, in collaboration with Hyema and to look at how we can leverage investments made to decarbonize aviation. Um, the idea is to utilize the battery and generation capacity uh, at airports needed to support electrification of inter island flights to create microgrids. These microgrids could serve as resiliency hubs to power community lifelines during events. Um, another planning grant, which uh, the Energy Office was awarded from FEMA uh, in collaboration with HIEMA, uh, will map the energy supply chain on Hawaii all the way through the community lifeline infrastructure. Uh, the purpose is to identify vulnerabilities in the energy supply chain that serve community lifelines and identify projects to either harden the supply chain or identify supply alternatives during events for those community lifelines. Um, and that leads us to uh, infrastructure projects which would do just that. 
Uh, HSEO, in collaboration with Hyema and Hawaiian Electric, uh, applied for three microgrids under FEMA's competitive brick program. Uh, critical customer hubs are a microgrid on the electric distribution system in vulnerable areas uh, that happen to be on the windward side of Oahu. Uh, as you may know, the windward side of Oahu is served by three transmission lines over the coal house, and there's no utility scale generation uh, on that side of the island. Um, the microgrids would be located in areas where there are high concentration of community lifelines, such as hospitals, fire stations, and shelters. There will be a number of opportunities under ESIA, BRIC, and other programs to invest in resiliency, and HSEO plans on taking a holistic approach when pursuing those opportunities and really keeping an eye on the services that the communities need uh, and that energy enables. And with that, I turn it back to you, Mark. Great, Chris. Nice job. Um, yeah, so Eric, can you, can you now bring up all of the 1A and 1B panelists? Um, I, I would like to go directly into uh, some of the questions right away. And I think this initial question would probably involve um, Dean and Brian perhaps initially, but anyone else can, can weigh in as well, um, particularly when we're talking about the incentives for low and moderate income uh, customers, some of the vulnerable or uh, disadvantaged customers that were, that were talked about in uh, Dean's discussion. Uh, Dean, you seem to indicate that um, you know, perhaps direct subsidy may not be the most efficient or effective route. There's, there's some difficulties in that. Uh, would you like to see, I think you did mention the loan and grant programs, but um, is that a better offset for those costs or would you uh, prefer to see uh, quotas, targets, uh, incentives? Uh, could you elaborate, could, could both of you elaborate a little bit more about Again, the most effective route to go into this or, or the other option, which is just the more transformative things that kind of lift everyone up. Well, if Brian doesn't mind, I, I guess I'll start and then, you know, Brian, please join in because I, I know, you know, we've engaged on this topic a, a number of times, but, it, but, it, but if I can clarify, I, I think uh, one of the issues that I raised was with uh, rebates, where it might require the low income customer or, you know, basically a customer to have upfront investment of funds that they might not have. And, you know, so from for some of these programs that have uh, percentage carve outs or something, 10% shall be reserved for low income customers. I, again, I, I don't know that that's been a very successful path because again, if the customers don't have the funds to get the rebate, that's that's where we're running into an issue. So certainly, um, you know, the, the possibility of exploring um, direct subsidies, I, I think, um, you know, Brian can probably share a little more where even where they have direct install, which is where Hoi Energy goes in and basically goes to a customer and says, hey, we can put this in for you basically at no cost because the program's paying for it. Uh, even there, there's running into a little trouble, but I think they've had more success with direct install versus, you know, relying on rebates. Um, so from that perspective, I, I think, you know, we do need to explore um, having those situations where we have d direct um, payment uh, coverage for the cost of the program. But I, I think Brian would agree that part of this still fundamentally remains trying to have better outreach to the customers to build that trust and understanding so that when Hawaii Energy or, or, or there's a utility um, distributed energy resource program that goes out to them to help them understand that, you know, this isn't something that is 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 like a scam or something that, you know, is, is too complex for them to participate in. It's an opportunity for them to help manage their energy usage as well as their customer bills. Um, Brian, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Sure. No, I think you're, I think you're spot on being, you know, the average consumer either doesn't care or doesn't really dive deep into some of the intricacies of, of the whole energy landscape. And so it is sometimes challenging to do what should be the easy work given some of the harder things that are happening around that. So definitely the community engagement is a big part of, of what needs to happen in the space. Uh, as it relates to to financing, I think you know there has to be some other way that we deliver the programs. To your point, um, <clears throat> you know we can provide direct installs, but not for large appliances. I mean that's covering the entire cost of the project. And so, is it that we're you know providing the entire cost and they're they're paying us back? Is that a model we need to look at? Do we need to leverage green banks and other financing, 
or do we need to you know find ways to really provide incentives to landlords a lot of uh, lmi customers are renting and they don't even have control over their large appliances and landlords are not inclined to to replace appliances that are working because often they're not paying the energy bill so there's a lot of structural changes that need to happen but absolutely the first cost is one of the barriers now i don't mean this question to be self-serving or anything uh for you um brian but in terms of the appropriate uh, entity to be able to carry that out, to actually deliver the service, uh, to be able to uh, place the rebates or the, or the grants uh, or, or the loan programs, where do you see that? Because this, again, part of this is to sort of identify the most efficient way, the most effective way, and to make sure that we have the best proposal from Hawaii to be able to carry this out. I think it's going to take a partnership. I mean, Hawaii Energy really isn't set up to be a financing entity. So, I mean, we obviously have those that focus in the space and it has to be that there's interest and priority or financial gain for, for folks to be able to be more interested in because this is low dollar, high volume work, right? With very high risk customers. So there's that fundamental challenge. But I think, you know, our work in the affordability and accessibility space has been really driven by a lot of community partnerships as well. So I think it's going to, a financing partner along with those community partners. Anybody else want to weigh in on that subject? Great. I, uh, I want to follow up with something that Rick uh, Pinkerton had talked about in terms of uh, uh, some of the efforts uh, to harden infrastructure, improve predictive modeling, uh, and some of these, you didn't mention microgrids in particular, but I know that uh, Cola uh, Poco uh, is looking at microgrid development as a way to kind of make their community more resilient. Um, you see the next step is developing plans to closely analyze those benefits, followed quickly by planning and design leading to deployment, or is that something that could be procured even in a more direct fashion? Yeah, and I, uh... I may defer to uh, Colton, uh, given his uh, oversight of the whole uh, uh, integrated grid planning process. But uh, you know, I, I will say just initially that what we're talking about uh, with our hardening efforts, you know, this is uh, you know we're focusing on kind of no regrets efforts that uh, that don't compete with these either third party or utility solutions, you know, microgrids or what have you. That they uh, uh, you know complement those. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, you did mention Coal Alpoco, where, where actually, I think today, uh, the applic application, sub-application gets filed uh, for three uh, uh, critical customer hubs uh, uh, for the uh, BRIC grant application. That's great. That's good news. Colton, anything further on that? I, I think Rick covered it pretty well, right? So we should all be thinking about resilience of utility infrastructure one that's really made up of many complementary efforts and strategies. Microgrids is a very, very important piece of it. Uh, it has not just like lines and, and grid benefits, but it also can have generation benefits beyond the microgrid function. Uh, but, but microgrids is one piece and there are, I think, other very, very important uh, complementary pieces as well, right? How do we make the entire generation portfolio uh, more resilient? How do we make the full grid uh, throughout all communities more resilient? Uh, and, and really that's where the latter is where Rick's program that he was discussing really focuses on. What are the, the no regrets efforts that we need to uh, undertake today so that we can begin making fast and large progress in improving the resilience of our system. Uh, if there's any one thing that we took away from, from David's uh, talk is that the, the threat is now, the risk is now. Uh, and so we gotta get moving now to make things incrementally better. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, David did make <laughs> some, uh, a case for the urgency. Um, yeah, I mean, it, in terms of the uh, focused investment, um, David, uh, if you had to sort of lay out number one, number two priority, any any particular thing? Uh, in, in our perspective, you know, 
speaking straight from emergency management and, and looking at a catastrophic event, it, it would definitely be trying to improve our position with an alternate uh, port capability. Something that's going to going to uh, offer the same type of uh, ability to, you know, commercial capability I would be a better way to put it. Commercial capability that the Port of Honolulu does, because you know, with with the limited storage, again, we don't have food supply that can withstand a, a long-term shutdown of that port. And of course, as we talked, going across systems, then that starts affecting energy, other resources that come into into the, the port of Honolulu. And um, and then, of course, that ultimately affects recovery, which, again, starts hurting us all in, in every system one more time, one more round of, of, uh, <clears throat> of um, reduction in, in recovery. So that that's where we see it. the first piece needs to lie is really to be able to try to bring back the capability of the port as rapidly as possible. Yeah, and we, and we know, of course, that the that's a long term uh, design planning build uh, it is. function. So for this tranche of funds, uh, I guess the first step would be uh, really identifying uh, the opportunities and and use that as a uh, I think even in Chris Chris's Chris Junker's uh, discussion, there certainly are planning grants and design grants that would be appropriate under this under this level of funding. Um, you know, who who would be some of the right people that we would need to bring in? Obviously, Department of Transportation, uh, but you know, that's that's is that something that uh, the form can help uh, sort of, I guess, alert and try to help coordinate and bring in the right people to, to study or analyze that situation? Uh, yeah, I, I believe absolutely it would be, there'd be a piece there um, for you. We're, why emergency management also spawn, um, applied for and received a, um, a resiliency program assessment and what we did, and that was from Department of Homeland Security. And so we have that ongoing right now and what we had them do is really look at our maritime transportation system. There's about three prongs to that, which I won't get into. But the bigger point is, is that they're going to give us back their assessment and some alternatives on how to go forward, which that would be a great driving document that we could all look at because there'll be a piece in there for every, every sector, huge piece for energy and how they're coming about and what we can do to the future. And it not only talks about alternate port, but also some of these, uh, like we were talking about uh, warehouse, emergency warehouse areas and, um, and a secondary marine transportation system, you know, moving to a smaller system until the, the, the main system comes back up, which again, huge ties with emergency and the rest of, of our sectors. Great, great. Well, I know we have rapidly, uh, run out of time. Does anybody have any pressing issue that you want to uh, bring up before we uh, go on to Senator Wakai? If not, I, ha I can't thank you all enough for this engaging discussion and uh, sort of the important issues that you talked about and, and of course the urgency to act. Uh, with that, uh, we'll conclude uh, sessions 1A and 1B. And um, from now, would like to um, introduce uh, Senator Glenn Wakai, uh, who's the chair of the Senate's Committee on Economic Development, Tourism and Technology. He's the vice chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs. And he's also a member of the Committee on Human Services and Ways and Means, importantly. He previously served eight years in the State House of Representatives um, and given the central objective to serve as a legislative briefing, Senator Wakai will lend his views on the most crucial infrastructure issues and overall energy sector issues uh, he feels that we should be addressing. Um, Senator Wakai, floor is yours. Thank you. Aloha, Mr. Glick. Uh, happy New Year, everyone. Happy new legislative session. Thank goodness for the feds. 
They're providing us the resources to improve our infrastructure to meet our 100% renewable energy goals. Now we have the resources to replace fossil fuels, fossil fueled megawatts with our mega wants of 2022. I have a renewed optimism because things were looking absolutely dismal last fall. We were on a short timeline to get renewable energy on the grid due to lawmakers in 2020 mandating a shutdown of the coal plant. We did so because of assurances by advocates that it was feasible to do so by this September. Lawmakers were sold on the bold idea to have Hawaii be the first state in America to ban the burning of coal. Press releases went out to pat ourselves on the back. But now, but two years later, we see the folly of creating policy based on press releases. It became apparent a year ago, we didn't have the renewable projects lined up to fill the 20% gap that uh, was caused by the closure of the coal plant. The fallback plan a year ago was to burn oil and then power batteries. Hmm. Then the supply chain took away the batteries. Oh, now the PUC is suggesting we get diesel power generators to prepare for a lack of capacity. Wow. Yeah, that's right. We're preparing to buy generators, burn more oil, and repairs are going to foot the bill for this lack of foresight. The coal plant is still burning, and we still are, and are already facing the threat of blackouts. Recent events on New Year's Eve and follow-up episodes indicate the grid is unreliable. PICO has to make multiple pleas to conserve power just in the past month. I admit I helped create the problem because I voted for the shutdown of the coal plant in 2022. It seemed like a good idea back then, provided everything lined up perfectly. Well, it hasn't. And I decline to be bamboozled by advocates setting goals or mandates with absolutely no strategy. So Senator Dela Cruz and I are now weaving together an assortment of bills to better anticipate and address the situations, steps that should have been taken years uh, ago. We have Senate Bill 3057, um, this bill will clearly define the renewable portfolio standards to be a percentage of electricity energy generated rather than sales. Uh, Senate Bill 2483 demands are first filled by renewable energy before dispatching fossil fuel generation. The opposite seems to be happening today. Uh, Senate Bill 2510 uh, indicates that we are making really good progress on our RPS, but right now it's all really dependent upon solar and wind. The bill establishes firm renewable energy generation policy in the Hawaii State Planning Act to clearly outline a path to 100% replacement of fossil fuels. We just really need to provide less guesswork and finger crossing in our strategy. Uh, Senate Bill 2513 is in line with all of our move to go for more firm renewables, this measure will require the PUC to have HECO separately issue requests for proposal for firm renewable generation and RFPs for intermittent renewable energy generation. Uh, another bill that's on the uh, slate of bills is Senate Bill 2171. This is the Wheeling Bill. We are planning to allow independent generators of renewable energy to cut deals directly with users. ECO will be fairly compensated for use of their transmission lines. This bill will allow a greater number of ratepayers to directly benefit from all the renewables that are lining up. Senate Bill 2474 is uh, our interconnection bill. We have a lot of hurdles with interconnection. This bill will inject the PUC to play a bigger role in the interconnection process. They will essentially become a referee in the PPAs. Uh, another bill that uh, we have on in store are incentives, excuse me, Senate Bill 2511. And this will provide incentives for renewable generation. Um, and, or ex excuse me, all of our past uh, incentives have focused on wind and solar uh, as, um, and, and, and all those incentives have focused on those two intermittent uh, sources. So the bill I just mentioned, 2511, will expand the Renewable Energy Technologies Income Tax Credit to include firm renewable energy systems. Um, and the last bill I wanted to highlight was Senate Bill 2283. This bill will have the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute conduct a study to examine the state's ability to advance hydrogen production from local renewable energy sources and develop the hydrogen strategic, ACE hydrogen strategic uh, plan.
But I just wanted to end by, you know, just conveying that there's so much on our legislative docket this year in the energy sphere. And we have so many renewable energy uh, projects and our future depends upon getting past obstructionists and we've all hijacked uh, our progress in the renewable space. Residents tell us they don't want wind in Kahuku, they don't want PV in Anakuli, they don't want offshore wind, they don't want biomass. When it comes to energy, the public is really good at defining what it doesn't want. We collectively, those of us on this call and everyone who's interested need to start defining what we want. Lawmakers are hitting the reset button this year and to be effective in accomplishing Hawaii's laudable objectives, we need to plan to identify what specific time bound steps need to happen and ensure we find the balance between intermittent and firm renewable projects. Policy by press release is in our rear view mirror. We have the feds filling our empty tanks. So the road ahead will be paved towards a brighter future. Thank you, Mr. Glick. Thank you for everyone on this call for your contributions to our renewable aspirations. Thank you so much, Senator Wakai. Really, do we do appreciate your candid appraisals and uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to be part of this uh, legislative briefing today. So now I'd like to dive directly into our final session on remaking transportation, which is a primary objective of the Biden administration with significant support for critical infrastructure improvements in, included in um, the Infrastructure um, and uh, Jobs Act. And as previously mentioned, why would expect to receive about 18 million over five years to support the expansion of the EV charging system, a network in the state and would have the opportunity to apply for grants out of the 2.5 billion available for EV charging. Uh, but there's a whole host of other funds available for hydrogen infrastructure and, uh, and improving the overall transportation infrastructure network. Presenting first to talk about some of those opportunities is uh, Pradeep Pant, who's a, a planning program administrator. He's the, the, the planning program administrator statewide for uh, the Transportation Planning Office at the Hawaii Department of Transportation. He leads the statewide transportation planning office that's responsible for establishing the comprehensive multimodal statewide transportation planning and for developing uh, the balanced multimodal statewide transportation plan and for uh, supporting the counties with technical assistance to help them fulfill their respective roles in the process. Following Pradeep will be Riley Saito, energy specialist at Hawaii County. And he's in charge of the Hawaii County's hydrogen agenda, transportation efforts. Many of you know Riley from his multifaceted career in the private sector, especially his decade of service at Sun Power Corporation, working on legislative policy and business development issues. Rounding out our transportation infrastructure group is Akeem Arso the Director of Electrification of Transportation at Hawaiian Electric. She leads the all fossil fuel free transportation solutions across the company's five island service territory. Many of you know Aki as the Managing Director for Policy and Community previously at uh, Elemental Accelerator. And before that is the Sustainability and Land Use Manager uh, for the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation. Now we're so pleased to have this esteemed panel. So Pradeep, can you kick off uh, including not only the uh, programmatic activities you'd like to highlight, but also some of the funding streams that Jay Boutte, the uh, Hawaii Department of Transportation uh, Director and your team have identified, including uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. Um, Pradeep, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, uh, for in inviting me to this important conversation today and very interesting uh, uh, and informative, informative sessions that we had earlier. Um, can we bring up the slides, please? Uh, let's look at where we are right now. Uh, this slide shows, uh, and primarily this is what uh, Scott showed earlier in the session in the morning today. Uh, the 2017 total greenhouse gas emission uh, 
this is out of the 2021 report, uh, greenhouse gas emission report for Hawaii uh, that was published in April of 2021. Uh, so that we actually were emitting about 16, 17.64 million metric tons of carbon, um, equivalent carbon uh, to the atmosphere. The highest was in 2007, since we uh, accounting is done from 1990. And for the 2017, which is actually the measures that was done in the last report, we, we saw that uh, the, the, the total emission was 17.64. Uh, the transportation sector emission is about half. That's what Scott was talking earlier. And the projection for 2020 and 2030, up to 2030, are just a projection. Uh, so that would be revised later on. But already we see that on the last report, there has been some adjustment on the aviation greenhouse gas emission. Uh, probably there is additional uh, decrease on the ground transportation emission. Uh, and hopefully that would be uh, there on the next revision of this, or next update of the report. So the challenge obviously over here is we are having a, a really uh, good uh, efficiency in terms of reducing uh, stationary uh, greenhouse gas emission. But since we, we, in absolute term, although we are reducing some of the transportation greenhouse gas emission, and of course the energy uh, by extension, uh, but in actual proportional, our share of uh, transportation greenhouse gas emission would, would be increasing from 50% at present to probably about 60, 65% uh, by 2030. So that, that's a challenge. That's what we, we need to actually work on. Next slide, please. Uh, because a lot of the federal policies are based on what is happening uh, as a nation, uh, this actually gives us a, quite a, a view of some of the policies that we saw on the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, um, as well as the initiatives that we are seeing right now. 30%, um, about 29% is the transportation greenhouse gas emission and energy consumption. Um, and out of that, about, um, about 79% uh, total light duty vehicle as well as freight, freight trucks are uh, within the among transportation, that is the contribution about 70, 70, 77% of that um, the transportation emission. Unlike uh, our odds in the national average, air only contributes to about 9%. Our is a kind of unique because we, are, we depend on air transportation. Our air transportation is as much as our ground transportation. transportation. And the projection is that by 2030, our air uh, greenhouse gas emission is going to be much more than our ground transportation, uh, greenhouse gas emission. The figure on the right actually gives us an idea on where uh, the opportunities are. Uh, if we look at the ground transportation, the state highway system con construction maintenance management is emitting about 6% of greenhouse gas emission. The administration, the buildings, uh, the vehicles are only uh, providing about 0.2% of greenhouse gas emission. And the system user, that means all of us who are using the highway system are actually uh, responsible for 93% of the greenhouse gas emission. I'm not saying that, you know, we, you know, everything has to be put on the user, but that's how, uh, you know, we driving the cars is essentially what is contributing to the greenhouse gas emission. And of course, by extension uh, to our um, uh, fuel consumption. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the works that we can uh, actually tackle on uh, making our transportation clean is basically three uh, areas that we have to focus on. And just uh, going back to our the, the last slide on the right side, we showed where we can work. The first one is to reduce emission from duties internal operation. That means, you know, across our all three modal division, highways, harbors and airport uh, for design and construction, payment strategies, maintenance, uh, vehicle fleet and uh, equipment, facility and administration. Um, and we're doing a lot on that. Um, so we, are, we have adopted sustainable and best construction management practices across all the divisions. Uh, the, you know, there are other 
uh, facility specific uh, work that we have been doing. And even on construction and uh, design of pavements, we are actually, in, uh, as a pilot, uh, we, are, we have been using injected, uh, injecting carbon waste uh, into the pavement. Uh, that's called a carbon cure. Um, we have been uh, installing PV panels, reducing portable water consumption and increasing water reclamation at airport, you know, but the reduction was uh, about 10%. So these activities do help. But if you look at the previous slide, it's only 0.2% uh, plus 6%. So we are, the, the most of the work is going to be on the second and the third areas that we are going to work. Uh, the second is actually uh, the reducing emission from transportation system uses. That has been done for a number of years now. Uh, basically, what we uh, mean by that is uh, working on the, our transportation demand management strategies. Uh, that means parking management, having car sharing, ride sharing, and SOB lanes, uh, promoting transit and alternate um, transportation, and even teleworking, you know, that, that was soon possible because of COVID-19. And fortunately, you know, we could switch up uh, to 100% of our work, uh, teleworking in some cases. Uh, some of the congestion relief program that we are doing is also contributing uh, to some of those strategies. And of course, uh, you know, when we are talking about, you know, there's a lot of talk about reducing VMT, and we probably need to be a little bit uh, careful on what we are discussing on that. Uh, it is not just a in a per se reducing VMT for any project, it is ab about minimizing the induced travel, vehicle travel. Uh, and on that, we also have to think about uh, how land use and transportation interact. Uh, so it is not just a very uh, clean uh, solution over there. There's a lot of interaction. Uh, there are a lot of structural uh, uh, issues that we have to address to really reduce or decrease the total VMT uh, that we see today. And the third strategy within that uh, area would be on internalizing some externalities. That means pricing is just using economy, uh, economic principle, road pricing, parking pricing, congestion pricing. So th I think th those, those are the opportunities that can be looked at. And I'm not saying that that, that could be possible, um, but th there are the alternatives out there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Third is basically what, what I think is uh, we are discussing today. Um, and essentially, uh, it comes into reducing emission of vehicle, uh, vehicles and fuel technology. And the first one is uh, a vehicle emission standard. And uh, that means the CAFE standard that we have and uh, the Biden Harris administration actually reversed the, uh, the rollback that had. Uh, you know, been done in the previous administration. So I think we are moving in the right direction on that. So internal combustion energy engine having much more efficiency is going to reduce um, fuel consumption and that ultimately would lead to greenhouse gas uh, um, reduction. The second strategy is probably the most uh, evolving one. And Underlying to that is uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the technologies that we have already been uh, implementing, uh, you know, throughout the nation. We are talking about uh, alternate clean vehicles uh, and energy, and individual mobility that uh, essentially is in now uh, electric vehicle uh, for uh, because of the technological advancement we have we have been seeing for the last uh, two decades, and there are four uh, areas that are really coming up uh, and evolving, as we say, um, as we discussed today. Uh, some is a shared mobility and it goes beyond the, you know, sharing of, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft and, thing, and, and, and such sharing. It is more of a having a shared electric autonomous vehicle, um, uh, a kind of a, a ownership. So uh, by some account, you know, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a, in a such a, you know, we can build up a scenario on how it can be uh, actually feasible. We actually, when we are traveling, uh, most of the time, you know, we go to work, drive 20, 30 minutes, and then park the whole day. In the evening, we get back to the car, drive again 20, 30 minutes. Rest of the time, the car is being parked. So our vehicle individually using is basically used for about one hour a day. That is very efficient in terms of economic uh, optimization of the resources. And 
already we are comfortable with the, the TNC and sharing and having a, um, uh, a shared uh, taxi system. Why not even think about having a shared mobility, shared ownership with the autonomous vehicle coming in, in into the picture? So these are all evolving technologies that would eventually benefit. So let's say that you know we can cut our actual uh, vehicle. You know, we're not talking about our mobility, reducing our mobility. We are talking about actual uh, having the vehicles to 20, 30 percent. If we can go into the whole share autonomous vehicle uh, um, approach, then probably would have opportunity to evolve into much more um, uh, carbon free uh, greenhouse gas, reduced greenhouse gas uh, environment. So on that itself, I think there are other technologies that are adding up the wireless power technology and then um, uh, transfer essentially, you know, just using like, you know, our cell phone now can be charged with uh, a wireless system. Uh, there are a lot of pilot work going on that uh, that shows that you know there is a 90-95% efficiency compared to the plug-in system uh, having a wireless system, both in the pavement, in the parking, or even in a dynamic lane, uh, vehicle lane system. So there are a lot of opportunities over there. A lot of work are, uh, even some of the DOTs have uh, actually started uh, piloting those technologies. There is another one I think uh, earlier in the, you know, right in the first presentation, Rick I actually mentioned about 20% of, uh, you know, 40% uh, of uh, vehicle electrify, electrifying. And then I think yeah, if I remember clearly, uh, he was talking about 900 gigawatt hours of uh, energy requirement per year. Uh, there is another uh, technologies that are actually being implemented uh, that could actually, actually help on those sort of metrics or uh, calculation. Uh, there is a vehicle to grid integration that we are seeing to, to, uh, today. There is a, actually a bi-directional energy flow, and that could be even a wireless, where EV uh, can be act, uh, acting as a distributed power source during the peak hour. And then you know they can charge during the off-peak hour, then they can actually provide the grid, the energy during the peak hour. So then uh, that would essentially bring down the firm um, uh, Power generation capacity that the uh, need, uh, the, the electricity uh, or the system would need. So there are those uh, options as well. And of course, uh, underlying to that is uh, uh, the vehicle automation and the connectivity technology um, that uh, is uh, uh, that is going to uh, reduce congestion. That is going to allow us to you know, have the share mobility uh, connected uh, autonomous vehicle. Um, all those uh, kind of integrates together. So those are the opportunities that we see uh, that out there. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, let's talk about some of the work that we are already doing at the DOT. Um, this one is about um, you know the EV uh, electrification and automation that we are working on right now. Uh, SDOT actually procured a service contract to replace IC uh, light duty vehicle. Um, this was po possible because of uh, Act 144 uh, from 2019, which allowed agency to contract for vehicle procurement or associated capital investment in charging or fueling infrastructure similar to facility-based energy service contracts. So uh, this contract, although we implemented that, this is available to almost all of the state and uh, county agencies. Uh, they can use the contract. I, I think Riley is going to talk about um, in, in his uh, presentation later on, um, how they are going to use this. Uh, we actually, uh, uh, replaced 43 IC vehicle last year uh, with EVs. And this year uh, we are working on uh, replacing 100 uh, trucks uh, with uh, electric vehicles. So that's basically a plan uh, that we have. And this contract is uh, for 10 years uh, and other agencies within the state and county can actually participate on the contract. So they don't need to uh, enter into another contract. They can use the existing contract uh, themselves. Um, next slide, please. Um, there are also some broadband um, and 5G and CAB technology that we are testing. You know that I all, uh, I mentioned uh, a couple of slides uh, before uh, this. The first one is a broadband uh, 5G uh, uh, project that we have. 
the pro broadband project uh, will provide state highway system with connectivity as well as uh, provide a reliable and affordable community Wi-Fi. Um, so that is also a community uh, focused uh, program. And uh, apart from providing that statewide connectivity to our system, um, highway system, it uh, also provides uh, those economic opportunity, you know, teleworking opportunities, also um, uh, providing the, um, the, the community with uh, internet access. Uh, we already have a contract with Hawaiian Telecom on this, uh, this $25 million contract, uh, dollar contract. And uh, it is um, by 2024, we have got eight pilot areas where we are going to extend the broadband. And we are already using that uh, money that we have on this. So this is a pro, uh, pro project which is already undergoing. There is another pilot program that we are working on. Uh, this is still on the drawing board. Uh, this is about the 5G connectivity um, uh, and connected uh, autonomous vehicle um, to provide safe, safe uh, mo mobility services to the people of Hawaii using integrated intermodal and multimodal transportation system. So this, this is a pilot program. And from that, we would be learning uh, and, and those lessons would be used for our future implementation for uh, those advanced programs. Next slide, please. Um, we're also working on uh, electrification of public transit. Uh, DOT uh, is uh, responsible for assisting the three counties other than uh, city and county of uh, um, uh, Honolulu because Honolulu is a direct recipient of uh, federal transit agency administration money. Uh, we we do collaborate with the city, with the city, but we are not directly responsible for their transit program. Uh, we help other the three counties, uh, so. Uh, as, a, as a pilot program uh, to electrify transit uh, fleets to G, uh, with uh, zero emission buses, uh, we are assisting the three counties uh, to, um, for a purchase of 12 uh, battery electric buses, uh, four buses in counties. And we're looking about uh, 60 to $18 million uh, uh, for the whole program. And the funding is coming out of uh, Federal Transit Administration Fund. Uh, we actually um, applied for competitive granting, uh, gr grants uh, in 2018 and 20, 2021, and we received about uh, $6.25 million. That was very competitive, although, you know, but uh, we, 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 we were able to use that fund as well as uh, some of the formula fund that we received for bus and bus facility. Um, and then also from uh, State Energy Office. There is a uh, Volkswagen Settlement Fund that we are going to use some of that fund. We are still working the um, the the details, and we are also looking at some of the HECO's uh, charge up and e-bus pilot program. Whether fund, whether that could be available for uh, the program, and of course, uh, the counties are going, also going to provide uh, local matches. So that fund is going to provide us with. Uh, implementing 12 uh, battery electric vehicles um, for each county. And hopefully the pilot program would provide information for us to transition into um, a full um, zero emission bus transit fleet. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, with the, at, at the end of the pilot program, we'd be having a transition plan for each of the three counties. Um, Right now, uh, we have completed uh, the our consultant have uh, has uh, complete, completed the preliminary route modeling. Um, then also, you know, because we have to look at each of the route and then uh, develop specification for each of the different uh, counties uh, transit system uh, that is ongoing right now. And si and since we are looking at the economy of scale, we are uh, thinking of uh, or actually having an arrangement to procure this uh, as a joint procurement. So there will be one procurement um, that will give us economy, economy of scale and hopefully a better uh, cost as well. Um, the pilot bus data, you know, once it is implemented, uh, we'll be collecting it for a year, and that data was, uh, will be going to be, uh, you know, included uh, further to refine our uh, transition plan. So at the end of the pilot project, we'll have a transition plan, and this would be actually 
going to be really effective for us to leverage uh, some of the fund, uh, fund that we may be possibly, uh, you know, look, uh, go after in the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure, Infrastructure Act uh, later. Next slide, please. This slide basically shows that we are not just talking about theoretical, you know, what could be achieved. We are, you know, with the four pilot buses or 12 pilot buses as a whole, um, greenhouse gas emission will be reducing uh, by 1,041 metric uh, short ton per year. And if we implement uh, the full transition, probably about 15,000 tons of uh, greenhouse gas emission would be reduced every year when all the fleet uh, is transitioned into zero emission vehicle um, fleet. Next slide, please. The other, you know, really important, you know, uh, foundation that we have uh, laid out uh, for uh, the uh, the bill is uh, having alternate fuel corridors defined. Um, so, working with um, HESO and uh, DOT, we have to work together. And now, all four counties have, and six islands actually have EV corridors designation. Um, so this will help on uh, us using our electric vehicle charging funds as well as charging and fuel infrastructure discretionary fund. That would be a very competitive fund, uh, which I think uh, Mark uh, earlier referred to, 2.5 billion every year. Uh, probably you know, one of the requirement would be you know, having alternative fuel corridors already defined. So we have already defined it for most of our network. So that, you know, that is a really a good groundwork that we have already completed. There's a two category there. There's a first is a corridor ready, which means that EV charging station are located um, no greater than 50 miles. So fast charges, the DC charges are located no uh, further than 50 miles and within the five miles of the highway. And there is corridor pending um, the where you know there are some uh, charging station, but does not meet uh, the initial threshold of having a corridor ready. So, the corridor pending. Uh, the last one we did was in Kauai just last year. So, a uh, couple of things that you know when we look at the the, the infrastructure act, um, you know it really addresses some of the critical issues that uh, we have seen uh, on the in the EV. Um, mainstream of uh, mainstreaming of EB uh, technology, uh, especially on the on the on the on the car. Um, so the biggest thing is about the cost, and of course there are you know provisions, the federal uh, tax rebates and uh, you know state tax rebates. Um, but more than that, if we look at or if we pull the uh, the uses, uh, there is a range concern. Um, but but in terms of technology, let's look at you know. You know, this is really surprising that until 1900, this the ground speed record was uh, held by electric vehicle. So even before uh, IC vehicle were the mainstream, the technology, the electric vehicle technology was on the prime at the time. And the, the, the biggest you know, factor where the IC uh, the, uh, took over the EV and we basically saw no development for the last one century was uh, because of the charging issues, um, because of the range and the performance. And probably the, the performance issue is now kind of uh, already not that issue. You know, we have seen a performance of a sports car and electric vehicle. So the other um, issue is uh, on um, the EV infrastructure infrastructure that we would need. So the BI, uh, BI, BIL actually addresses those. Let's go to the last slide. Uh, so this is basically discuss about discusses about what are the fundings that is going to be available uh, for for the highways, uh, the federal highway fund. There is going to be a twenty one percent increase compared to the last year. This uh, this financial federal financial year. So we are going to uh, receive about. Uh, $228 million. Of course, they are for most of the you know, uh, formula funds. But the good thing about uh, the, 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 the new act, the bipartisan infrastructure law, is that there are two new programs that could be really uh, dedicated to the EV and alternative um, fueling infrastructures. The first one is a carbon reduction formula program. Uh, this year, we received about 5.2. And the second one is electric vehicle charging 
um, that uh, for this year we received 4.2, and then you can just multiply for five year for five by for the four years that would be five years for the, that would be receiving the fund. And there is also a charging and fuel infrastructure discretionary fund that is a competitive fund that is 2.5 billion per year. So there's a lot of fund that it can be possibly available for us to work uh, on our uh, system and processes over here. And on, on the FTA side, there is going to be a 30 to 35 percent increase in our on our formula funds. And uh, more importantly, low or no emission vehicle discretionary fund that uh, is a competitive uh, has increased uh, to 5.6 billion um, total. Um, so it is about eight or nine times more than what is, it used to be previously. Um, so with those funding, um, the, the details are still being worked out. Actually, today is the last day for you know providing the you know federal highway put out a request for information on the on the electric vehicle charging and charging and vehicle vehicle fuel fueling infrastructure guidance and today is actually the last day so within a couple of months we would be getting a detailed guideline on what projects would be eligible what are, what would be the requirement but some of the things that we have already done you know having uh, on the FTA side having um, a transition plan that we are working right now or uh, defining the uh, EV corridor is going to help us on securing all those funds with that I think um, I'll hand over uh, back to Mark and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, we're going to move directly. We're running a little over uh, to uh, Riley. Uh, floor is yours. Hello, and thank you, uh, Mark, and each in the eye to uh, having holding this. It's really relevant and diverse in, in its information. If you could start the slide deck. It's interesting listening to the uh, various presentations of uh, how it all seems to tie into what I'm about to uh, provide. So the hydrogen transformation, this first shot is an actual built out hydrogen production station. It's at the Nelha on the big island in Kona. And uh, it was designed, engineered and worked through by HNEI on a grant. Next slide. So Scott and I had the same thought, look at the sources and uses and compare it. And um, so he went through all of this. I'm focused mainly on addressing the green bar. Uh, that is the kind of the monster of fossil fuel that we're trying to uh, address. Next slide. And interesting on the data for the big island, transportation accounts for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 57.9%. And, and with the size of the island, the topography, you know, 4,000 square miles, it uh, really has a heavy dependence on mobility uh, via fossil fuel, uh, you know, ICEs. Next slide. So hydrogen really, it, it fits the island profile in its needs. It's zero emissions. It um, has a large range and flexibility of where and how you use the, um, the, the energy source. It can be transported. Very similar, it's a, it's a transportable gas. So anything that like Hawaii gas, American gas, the gas companies that move uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide and uh, methane, propane, all of those gases get, the infrastructure exists. So we can have diversified production areas that produce hydrogen that is cost competitive and it can be located to the point of need and stored there if necessary or consumed there. Next slide. So there's just a, you know, what kind of preaching to the choir on, on the work that has been done. You know, Senator Lakai and Rep Lowen really worked on HRS 3642, which is what the uh, sustainability partners, third-party finance uh, that allows the third-party financing for fueling and charging infrastructure along with the vehicles and where, Hawaii County is heavy leaning toward, uh, we are advancing in that to potentially within two, three years, convert half of our bus fleet to zero emissions, along with uh, having the, the energy needed, zero, ener zero emissions energy needed through hydrogen or photovoltaic battery and or fuel cell generators. Next slide. So the, the actual source of energy 
we're looking at changing that from being imported to being produced. And that's through landfill, um, it waste to energy, no combustion, no combustion. We, we currently have a, two landfills that are closed. I, one is closed, one is open. They both, um, the closed one is just leaching methane into the atmosphere. So we wanna capture that. The studies initially show that it could operate a 1.6 megawatt generator 90% of the time, 24 seven, 365. So that energy could actually be used to generate hydrogen through electrolysis, which would provide up to an estimated 2.1 million bus miles a year. Our entire bus fleet route um, is 3.3 million miles. So it will take care of two thirds of what it, fuel is needed to operate our entire fleet. The landfill on the West Hawaii side is active. It has an existing landfill gas capture system that uh, Currently, we flare it according to EPA standards, which is about, and it, we're flaring 270 standard cubic feet per minute. And that's 24 hours a day all year long. That's 43% methane. If we capture that and uh, utilize that for a landfill gas generator, it can produce uh, 3,600,000 bus miles. So between the two landfills, we can not only handle our entire bus fleet, we can handle all our tractor trailer trucks. We can handle the, uh, or fuel the entire uh, county vehicle fleet. Although, um, and we can, in that, that process we'll capture the carbon that's part of that process. And we'll use that carbon toward producing airline fuel, a kerosene. So we'll car carbon capture produce, uh, pipeline quality methane. And if we have excess methane, we'll, we'll move toward replacing propane that's currently imported to the island. So very uh, aligned with the work that Hawaii, Hawaii Gas is looking at. We also have our geothermal plant, which actually, if we had an expansion of geothermal technology, we could produce enough airline fuel for the entire state. And the standards that everyone else is working on is wind and solar. Next slide. Next slide. This is a summary of what I had just gone through. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And so this is just a, how we're looking at a closed loop hydrogen economy. You'll have the presentations. You can go through it at that time and when you get it. Back to you, Mark. Well, thank you so much, Riley. Um, Really appreciate that, uh, especially the leadership you're doing at Hawaii County. Because of uh, a time uh, another time commitment, we're going to uh, just switch the last two speakers. I want to move directly uh, to Representative N uh, Nicole Lowen, who you all know is chair of the House Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. I'll dispense with the rest of the uh, in uh, introduction uh, of this important uh, legislator. So we'd like to hear her view now, um, Representative Lowen. Thank you. And thanks so much for uh, letting me go a little early. We have sessions starting at noon. Um, uh, first, I wanna say thanks to Mark, Rick, Megan and Dallas for working on this and bringing us all together and including um, you know, the legislature, the legislators who make policy in the energy policy forum. We do appreciate that. Um, as probably most of those watching today know, um, and, and certainly the panelists, the Hawaii State Legislature has been um, the leader in shaping the renewable energy transition. We had Act 234 uh, in 2007 passed before I was in office that set the first greenhouse gas emission limits. Uh, the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative in 2008, the establishment of 100% RPS by 2045 and 2015. In 2018, a net negative emissions goal by 2045, and then since I've been chair of this committee, we've done um, a lot of work on efficiency and clean transportation, including uh, passing our barrel tax funded electric vehicle charging system rebate program, and then my bill from last year to transition uh, state fleets to zero emission vehicles. Um, so building on that this year, I thought I'd talk 
quickly about some of the bills, uh, highlights of bills. There's a lot of bills uh, more than this, but highlights of bills um, looking at this year. Uh, I have House Bill 1800. This is updating the state's greenhouse gas emission limits um, to set a goal to be 70% below 2005 levels by 2030. And this would include aviation related emissions, which had previously been excluded. Uh, it's an ambitious starting point to have a discussion about this, I think, but as it stands right now, our, our 2020 goal to be below 1990 levels was met. And now there's really um, nothing, no hard goal in, in state law remaining. So we need to address this. And then this bill also includes a, a study directing the state energy office to do a study to see how are we going to reach these goals, this goal and the 2045 goals we have, what uh, steps do we need to take in, in the energy sector in transportation and planning and land use and agriculture, um, workforce development, like across all sectors, how will we get to zero emissions by 2045. Um, House Bill uh, 1521, this bill is directing the Public Utilities Commission to consider um, rates for low and moderate income uh, individuals or families, rates or credits or other programs that would address energy equity issues. And I think this bill is an important piece of the puzzle in uh, getting the whole community on board with the clean energy transition. Um, since I think recently there's sort of been more opposition to different developments in different areas as, as these projects move forward. Uh, House Bill 1801, this is a repeat. We've had a few years in a row, but this is pushing for energy efficiency in all state facilities over a certain size. Um, to have the state lead by example in um, uh, you know, having better energy efficiency in state buildings. You know, energy efficiency remains the... Um, least exciting, but also least cost resource. So we need to keep pushing on that front. Um, we have, uh, there's House Bill 2090, and this is actually a bill in the governor's package to provide rebates to low and moderate income individuals and families for the purchase of electric vehicles. And that is a similar structure to our um, electric vehicle charging system rebate program where it would be barrel tax funded. So I appreciate the governor um, and his team working on that. Um, and then the last bill I thought I would highlight was House Bill um, 1808, and this redirects some of the geothermal royalties that are paid towards being reinvested in geothermal resource um, uh, identification and development. I think that um, this bill can be a jumping off point to kind of elevate more conversation around geothermal energy and, and how we can better invest in growing that resource. I really think that um, Geothermal has a lot of potential, especially for Hawaii Island. It can kind of be our, our superpower for meeting our energy needs, but also, um, you know, as a, a really a clean and available local resource potentially could help us to invest in new kinds of industries and, and things. So there's some opportunity there if we can work through um, some of the community resistance that it's seen in the past. I think that still remains an obstacle we have to address. Um, you know, and then, you know, I, I don't, I can't say I agree with everything Senator Wakai said, so we'll be having some interesting conversations this year, but I do think as he alluded to, we will see a lot more discussion um, about what role, the role of the legislature should be in um, helping to promote development of other resources beyond just wind and solar, like geothermal, uh, you know, offshore wind, biofuels, hydrogen, long duration storage options and other new technologies. So not all of these are there yet in terms of being commercially viable and some of them may never make it, but we do need to start looking ahead to, you know, these 2045 dates and how we'll get, and I think Rick kind of talked about this at the start, how we'll get from, you know, 70% or 80% or 90% to 100% because there's, you know, there is gonna be a point where uh, wind and solar and four hour battery backups not gonna cut it for 100%. So we need to start, um, you know, now that we're past this initial phase of RPS, we've got to um, expand that conversation. Um, I guess I'm a little skeptical about the legislature mandating uh, specific percentages of certain types of resources, unless somebody has a crystal ball um, that I can, can borrow, but you know, we do need to start planning ahead, I guess. And then finally, before I head down to session, I just think it's important to step back and remind ourselves of the big picture and why we do this work. Uh, because climate change is real and urgent because Hawaii is not resilient when we rely so heavily on imported um, fuel from unstable parts of the world uh, because we want to develop local resources and keep those dollars in our economy 
and control our own energy future. And because we have to ensure that rates here in Hawaii are affordable, um, where so many families are struggling to meet their basic needs, even like while they're fully employed. Um, so I think that we should be you know, wary about promoting a narrative that pits these goals against each other because um, we need energy that's reliable and affordable and local and clean. And like each of those goals is, is criti critically important. And I think if we all work together, we can get there. So thank you again, Mark, for squeezing me in a little early. I really appreciate it. And um, I guess I'll try to catch up the rest of this session. Uh, I'll check out the recording after. So thank you and aloha everybody. No, that, that sounds great. Uh, thanks so much, Representative Lowen. Um, and we'll look for maybe some special resolutions uh, from you later in the year. Uh, in any event, I uh, appreciate your leadership. And uh, thank you, Aki, for allowing that switch. Uh, we're actually going to give you the last platform. We have a very hard stop at noon, as we're told from Think Tech. So um, please sort of lay out the, the finality of this uh, transportation panel. Uh, the pressure's on. Um, I'll try and do my best to land the electric or hydrogen plane of this session. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, you know, I was reflecting in preparation for this presentation that this is my third Hawaii Energy Policy Forum legislative briefing that I've spoken at. And during sound check today, Jay actually also kindly reminded me that I look much older. <laughs> so thanks, Jay, you can't get anything past him. Um, but I, I did want to share that this is my most pivotal one as well, uh, for, for personal reasons, actually. And that's because this legislative session, I'll be having my first baby. And um, I mentioned that, not just to talk about a baby, but because we have this huge opportunity in front of us right now with all of this federal funding coming down the line. And um, what that means is that the policies, decisions, priorities, and roadmaps that we set this year will really have meaningful impact, not just for right now, and you know, having that win or that headline of getting the funding, but also for this next generation. And so when we're talking about these seemingly far off, you know, sometimes it almost feels meaningless forecasts of 2040, um, when our energy is gonna be mostly powered by renewable sources and over half our cars will be powered by that clean energy, which is really exciting. It'll also be when my future son turns 18, and it's also going to be when he has the opportunity to vote for the first time. So I just want to remind everyone kind of in, in closing that what we do today will really have a huge impact in creating that future world. So if you can pull up the slides, uh, if there's two things that I want you to take away from what I say today, it's that one, we at Hawaiian Electric, we're listening very closely to the market and um, the market needs and our customers. And while, there is, while we do see huge market pull from the electric vehicle space, um, we also need great policy to ensure that that market pull uh, results in good outcomes for our communities. And then number two, uh, we're here, we at Hoenn Electric are here to help the state meet its transportation decarbonization targets. And so that really reflects on a lot of the work that Riley is doing at the county level and um, Pradeep mentioned in his opening remarks uh, to ensure that we can help that the big chunk of drivers out there, transportation out there really decarbonize rapidly. Next slide, please. So to address the first point about the market, um, for those who have been following over the last few years, the auto industry has committed to investing billions and like tens of billions of dollars in electric vehicles. And we're seeing the purchase of electric vehicles skyrocket, not just in Hawaii, although we do, we're, you know, we have the second highest vehicle EV ownership per capita, but also we're seeing uh, over 150% growth in EV sales across the rest of the United States, Europe, and Asia. 
And so you may, some may be wondering why are the feds investing so aggressively in this space right now? And it's because we're actually behind the curve, the US is, um, and we need to play catch up with the rest of the world. And so this is really you know, a, a big opportunity for us. Next slide. Um, and then in our you know, local forecast, we're seeing huge increases of electric vehicles as well. And we're re revising these right now, uh, but policy is going to be important to make sure that this wave of growth serves the public good. And so you know, these are conversations that we have with the Public Utilities Commission, with our legislators. And there were several bills introduced this year, Rep Lowen mentioned Governor Ige's EV, rebate bill for um, low and moderate income communities that are really targeted in ensuring that um, the, the uh, expansion of electric vehicles is really serving everyone. And then in the past, there have been subsequent sessions where bills like the state fleet transition goals um, and dedicated funding to EV rebates that, you know, Hawaii Energy is doing just a awesome job distributing and administering, um, all of those bills are also foundational to ensure these good outcomes. So looking forward to this session coming up. Next slide, please. So on the second point, you know, HECO has been working within the electrification of transportation sector since 2012. And we've been very strategic about soliciting community input and developing long-term strategies like an electrification of transportation roadmap in 2018 to ensure that we really optimize the, level, the levers that we as a utility can toggle to fill in gaps. And so these levers are public charging, rates, and infrastructure. Next slide. So on the public charging front, we've been piloting a program since 2012, and we have 25 chargers across our service territory, but we've heard from our customers that they need more charging and more reliable charging. And so last winter, next slide please, we filed a proposal to expand this program to serve 28% of the public char fast charging need by 2030 and 10% of the public level two charging need by 2030. So we're in no way trying to take over the market or anything like that, but we really want to um, create a critical backbone and catalyze private investment to carry the rest. Um, next slide, please. We also have, um, thanks to the, for the support from the Public Utilities Commission, have two commercial rates that leverage uh, time of use design to incentivize charging during the middle of the day. Next slide, please. And last but not least, we recently received approval for two pilots that allow us to develop the infrastructure. So Pradeep mentioned the charge of eBus pilot that's launching next month. And then we recently got approval to launch our Charge Ready Hawaii uh, later this year, um, probably around the October timeframe. And this will allow us to assume the cost of infrastructure for bus operators, uh, apartment condo dwellers, commercial entities that are thinking about workplace charging and fleet transition, and of course, third party charging providers as well, public charging providers as well. So. Um, I think we're about at time. I did my best to keep it short, but uh, that's all I have for today and happy to answer any questions. Wow, no, th thank you. Thank you so much, Aki. Uh, really great summary. And you did that really fast. I know that was a, lot, that was a big presentation. Um, I'm gonna be very brief in the, in the wrap up. We won't have time really to, I think, go into uh, all of the wonderful questions because we're uh, really over the uh, final time limit but we will be posting all of the presentations on the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum site. We'll have some comments. It'd be a great time also uh, for the questions that were uh, prepared in the Q&A Q section and the ones we can pull from the chat. Uh, we'll get back with the presenters and try to have answers for those as well. And that will also post on the Hawaii Energy Policy site. Uh, we'll be looking to form uh, the appropriate committees or follow-up actions uh, to be able to track, monitor, and to help uh, forge and support collaborations uh, from all the things that we learned here today. Again, we're attempting to fill the gaps of the unfinished business of the Hawaii, of Hawaii's uh, energy transition. And of course, this year, try to take advantage of this 
important pools of funds, including the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill and uh, the other assistance programs that uh, will help us uh, truly meet all of our objectives. I can't thank every, you know, everyone who participated uh, for providing such great presentations uh, throughout uh, this long session. Obviously, the um, more than 100, uh, nearly 150 people who attended, uh, some internationally, uh, didn't get a chance to take your questions directly. But again, we'll certainly be following up on those. Also look to our site for further information on the next cohort of the Energy Transition Initiative uh, Partnership Program uh, to obtain technical assistance for whatever project that you want to achieve. Uh, that deadline will be uh, on April 15th, but more information will be posted on our site and some of you will probably receive information directly. And uh, with that, uh, this session is uh, concluded. I also just want to briefly thank uh, some of the same people that Rick uh, thanked in the beginning, uh, Megan and Dallas and Mitch, obviously Rick Rushlow for providing the uh, financial resources and, and the overall support of this initiative, and to the Think Tech team, uh, Jay Fidel and Senator Moore for uh, her undying support of this Hawaii Policy Forum, and to all of you. Thank you. We're adjourned.